here. Okay. Is my microphone working? go ahead and empty out the waiting room. Madam Chair, I believe the waiting room is now been emptied and I'll keep on allowing people in as they arrive. Please everybody uh, remain muted. As you entered the waiting room, don't unmute until you're called on to speak. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the uh, June 2nd meeting of the Churchill uh, Planning Commission. Thank you all for attending. Um, we're scrolling up uh, the agenda for this evening. So for the first, uh, is we will uh, call to order, roll call. Uh, Diane Law. Here. Richard Kelly. Here. Mike Moita. Here. Daniel J. Dell. Here. And myself, all present. Uh, once again, uh, Diane is participating as a, uh, she's participating, she is not commenting since she's a member of council uh, and also on the planning commission. Um, I guess we'll start off with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of Allegiance, I pledge to, allegiance the flag. to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Um, The first is uh, consideration of accepting of the meeting minutes from the May 5th meeting. Uh, do I have a uh, motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Okay, may I have a second? Is there a second? second. Richard Kelly seconds. All agreeable, say aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. It's passed. Uh, table from the May 5th, uh, 20. 21 uh, meeting was the Ch Churchill Creek project application for conditional use approval and application for land development approval. Um, the project status and uh, uh, what's been done to date, we will uh, have a short presentation, but I believe first we're gonna have a presentation uh, uh, from the borough solicitor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for those folks who were here last month and the month before, um, I apologize for repeating myself, but I know we have some new faces here. So I just wanted to 
give a general rundown of, of where we are in the process, um, sort of outline the procedure, um, and then, you know, sort of next steps going forward after, uh, after tonight's meeting. Uh, so uh, if, just by way of introduction, um, you know, we all know the property. We're talking about the former uh, Westinghouse uh, Research and Development Site at 1310 Beulah Road. Um, I think folks are aware, but just to be clear, the borough does not own this property. Uh, the borough uh, did not solicit or seek out this particular type of development. Uh, and uh, it's actually the property owner who uh, is proposing to sell the property uh, to an entity that would construct a warehouse distribution center on the site. Um, in Pennsylvania, property owners generally have the right to use their property as they wish, uh, subject to compliance with you know, local, state, and federal regulations that are applicable to uh, land development. Uh, in particular, in the borough of Churchill, there are two primary ordinances that are at play here. Uh, one is the Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance, and that's uh, often referred to in slang as SALDO. Uh, and then there's the Zoning Ordinance. Um, and, and in particular, we're focused on the Zoning Ordinance tonight because what we have before uh, the Planning Commission tonight is what's called a Conditional Use Application. So a Conditional Use Application uh, simply means that an applicant is permitted to uh, use property for particular use as long as they can uh, establish that they comply with the criteria in the ordinance. So in, in Churchill zoning ordinance in the C1 zoning district, which is where this property is located, uh, warehouse distribution centers are permitted as conditional uses. Uh, so it's up to the applicant to establish uh, to first the planning commission and then ultimately at a public hearing before borough council that they are able to establish the criteria uh, from the zoning code. Uh, in particular, uh, the criteria for this particular use uh, include the following. Um, it does require a traffic study and a proposal to mitigate any additional traffic that would be added as a result of the distribution center. Uh, there's a maximum of 125 feet uh, foot height. Um, a parking study is required. Uh, there is a lighting study and a sound study, as well as proposals to mitigate any negative impacts from lighting and sound as a result of the development. Uh, there's also a uh, environmental impact study, and uh, that includes things like stormwater management, uh, water quality, and air quality. So essentially, the applicant developer is required to uh, conduct, conduct all these different studies and then uh, submit proposals as to first ide by identifying the potential impacts and then proposals um, as to how those impacts will be mitigated so as to, to limit the impact um, on the residents of the borough of Churchill. Uh, there's a timeline that's established under state law for these particular uh, types of applications. Uh, the applications were filed back in December. Uh, technically, uh, under the uh, what's called the Municipalities Planning Code, essentially Pennsylvania state law, uh, the borough had 60 days from the date of the application to, uh, for borough council to initiate its public hearing in this matter. Uh, as a result of the scope uh, of this development, the size, the magnitude, um, an acknowledgement by the developer and their, their team that, that this is a, a significant impact, not just to Churchill, but to the surrounding area. Uh, we have been granted uh, the borough uh, a number of extensions uh, by the applicant in order to provide time, uh, both for the applicant to do the necessary studies and for the uh, borough and its consultants to review those studies and provide comments um, so that there's a sort of a back and forth process going forward. So uh, the current uh, deadline uh, for Borough Council to begin its conditional use hearing is July 12th. Um, so that's the date we're working it with as, as we sit here today. Um, that is subject to potential future extension depending on how things uh, move forward. But based on that timeline, uh, the Planning Commission uh, would not be expected to make a vote to recommend one way or the other tonight but instead would be uh, expected to make that vote at the July uh, Planning Commission meeting, which would be the first Wednesday in July, maybe the second, I do not have that calendar in front of me, uh, but um, that, that's, that's the expectation, excuse me, the expectation at this point. Uh, I think it's important to uh, explain what the roles are of the two, uh, the two bodies. The Planning Commission, uh, which is where we are tonight, is a recommending body. So the Planning Commission uh, reviews the evidence and uh, makes a determination ultimately as to whether or not they feel that the applicant has 
met the criteria in the zoning code, the, the criteria that I just uh, I just ran through. Um, if they feel that way, if they feel that the, the applicant has met those criteria, uh, they're required to vote to recommend the project that it be approved. Um, if not, they're required to vote that it not be uh, approved. So this is not a matter of whether the planning commissioners or ultimately council likes this development or doesn't like this development. They are uh, supposed to take an objective review of the evidence that's submitted and make a determination as to compliance with the zoning ordinance. If the applicant can establish a compliance, um, they're required to move it forward. Um, both the planning commission and the council uh, is permitted to or are permitted to uh, provide or attach uh, reasonable conditions to the development uh, to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Um, and so that is something that, you know, should uh, this uh, planning commission and ultimately council uh, make that recommendation and make that vote, uh, those sorts of conditions uh, would likely be added to any kind of approval uh, above and beyond the conditional conditional use criteria that are uh, that are in the zoning code. Uh, so this tonight is tonight is not a public hearing. Uh, it is a it is a meeting at which there will be a presentation by the applicant. Uh, again, attempting to establish uh, you know compliance with those criteria. Uh, after that presentation is done, there will be uh, comments from the borough engineer, questions and comments from the planning commission and uh, ultimately uh, time for members of the public to uh, speak up to three minutes each um, on, on this subject to provide comments, questions, either for or against the project. Um, at the uh, close of this meeting, um, as I said, it's likely, uh, and I'll we'll, we'll defer to applicants council to confirm, but it's likely that the applicant is just going to be asking that the planning commission table this another month, uh, again, to to allow the applicant to continue to conduct the necessary studies and submit the necessary uh, evidence to establish compliance with the criteria. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the decision will be made by borough council after a public hearing. Uh, and again, that's, uh, that, that's scheduled tentatively for July 12th um, at, a, uh, uh, at a format and location uh, to be determined, um, you know, depending on the circumstances and, and at the discretion of borough council. Um, with that said, Madam Chair, is there uh, anything else you wanted me to hit on before we turn it over to the uh, applicant? No, thank you, uh, Solicitor Rob. I think that was a good summary of what our duties are and what our responsibilities are with respect to this project. Thank you. Um, all right. We, uh, it's my understanding um, that we have a um, presentation from Hillwood, an updated presentation. So with that... Uh, um, not sure who from Hillwood is uh, going to lead the charge, but I'll defer to them. Yeah, Leif or Tim, who would you like me to allow to share the screen? Alex, if you could uh, give me the, the screen rights, that'd be great. That'd be great. I'm doing that in one moment here. While uh, Tim gets set up, just to prove a few ground rules, please uh, remain muted unless you're speaking. Later on in the presentation, after uh, their presentation and the Planning Commission opportunity to address or have questions, public will be able to speak. You'll be able to raise your hand by going to the bottom of the screen and selecting that option. <clears throat> we'll try our best to get everyone who has their hand raised, as well as others who are maybe on the line and just need to, uh, aren't able to do that. So you'll have your opportunity to speak uh, towards the end of the meeting. Thank you. Tim? All right, great. Can everyone uh, see my screen? Yes. Good deal. All right, well, well hello and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Podwell, and I uh, represent Hillwood, the developer. Um, I'd like to thank the Planning Commission for allowing us the opportunity to again present our project and uh, the progress that we've made since our last meeting in May. Um, we understand that this is a significant project, and with that, a lot of questions and concerns are being raised. As a developer, we welcome that and realize that the input from the Planning Commission, Council, and its constituents is essential to a successful projects for long-term benefit in the community. And we hope that the borough recognizes our efforts to work in a collaborative manner with the Council, Planning Commission, and Gateway Engineering to achieve a positive outcome for this project that could positively impact the current and future members of the community for generations to come. Uh, again, I just wanted to open up saying thank you for uh, your time this evening. And with that, I will turn it over to Leif Metz. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Alex, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, I want to add um, my thanks to Tim. So, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission, <clears throat> thank you very much for having us again. The members of the public, uh, thank you as well for your participation and for being here with us again tonight. I also want to thank the, the borough manager and the solicitor uh, for their um, engagement in this process. <clears throat> I thought it would be helpful just to start by taking a step back and to kind of review the bidding on from the developer's perspective, <clears throat> why we think that the project is a net positive to the borough. Uh, as Tim mentioned, we know that there are a lot of questions and a lot of concerns that have been raised by the residents and we will um, respond to a number of those uh, today, but we just wanted to start with sort of the fundamental question of, is this a net positive for the borough or not? Uh, and there are a number of reasons why we think that it is a net positive. Uh, the, the first one is just the magnitude of jobs that can be created by the project. Uh, what's projected is between 1,000 and 1,500 full-time jobs once the facility opens, and those jobs will have full-time benefits from the first day of work. Uh, they'll also have uh, educational expense reimbursement for the people who work there and are, and are going to school to continue their education. Uh, and the salaries for those positions will be in the mid to high teens per hour. And uh, one of the things that's really attractive about the location is the proximity of the labor pool to this site. And the, the types of jobs that are being offered here are things that can be really transformational to families to give them access uh, to a living wage in the workforce you know, with a, a high school education and then the opportunity to advance from there. That's something that we're really proud of and that we know that that motivates uh, the support of some of the regional leaders for the project. In addition to the full-time jobs at the facility, there will also be an equivalent number of construction jobs uh, while the site is being built. And we know that's something that's of, of great regional importance also. So the jobs are, are really the number one benefit that, we, that we're very proud of. The second significant benefit is the new tax revenue. And in previous uh, presentations to Planning Commission, we have mentioned that the total project cost is expected to be about $300 million. So the taxes would flow from that cost. And a question that has come up since then is, uh, well, the, the size of the building has been reduced and what effect will that have on the taxes? And that, that's a great question. And so what happened is we were originally proposing uh, a project that would be about 860,000 square feet was the footprint of the building. We subsequently reduced that to, a, to about 634,000 square feet. So it's roughly a 25% reduction in the size of the building. And that has been uh, kind of equally offset uh, by about a 25% increase in construction costs that has resulted from COVID. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen in the news that there's uh, kind of disruptions to the global supply chain, in particular in lumber and steel and other construction components caused by COVID. So kind of across the board, a 25% increase in construction costs has been the result. So building size down by 25%, construction costs up by 25%. So our expectation is that the total project cost is gonna be just about the same at about $300 million. Uh, so we don't have any change to the um, earlier tax uh, forecast that we, that we had shared. Uh, but that, that's gonna be a substantial amount of new tax revenue uh, to sort of replace what had uh, once been generated by the Westinghouse site, but that that uh, today is generating approximately $27,000 a year uh, in tax revenue. Uh, so that, that will be a really uh, meaningful improvement. Uh, the next thing is the environmental remediation. So today the buildings, there's about a million square feet of buildings that are on the site. And those buildings are significantly environmentally contaminated. Uh, there's a lot of asbestos, there's also lead and there's also mold that are in the buildings. Uh, and so the buildings have been sitting there, you know, vacant for 20 years, aside from occasional use for, for movie productions. Uh, so one of the benefits of the project will be that all of those buildings will be demolished uh, and both the buildings and the site itself will be remediated to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's standards. Uh, so we'll, we'll end up with, you know, significant environmental um, contamination 
having been cured um, because the project is there. Uh, another meaningful benefit is the improvement in the stormwater runoff. Uh, we, we know that, um, that the borough has experienced a lot of flooding over, over recent years. Uh, and so one of the requirements to develop this site uh, is that the rate of stormwater that's running off the site during storms has to be reduced by 20% from what it is today. And so it, it isn't just that we have to keep it static with where it is today and you know, not make it worse by the development, but through the development, we have to improve it. So we're reducing the speed at which water is running off the site during storms. And as you'll see later in the presentation, we're, we're significantly exceeding that 20% threshold. Uh, in addition to that, the, the stormwater is also going to be uh, treated so that the, the water that is running off of the site is going to be cleaner than it is today. Uh, so certain compounds like phosphorus and nitrogen are going to be removed from the runoff, uh, as well as some other um, solids that uh, we'll talk about later in the, in the presentation. So compared with present, post-development, the stormwater will run off more slowly and the water that runs off will be cleaner. Uh, so that's something else that we, that we feel really good about. Uh, the last thing is that um, Hillwood uh, has you know, mentioned a number of times during the process their, their aim and their history of being uh, a solid and, and valued community partner in the communities where they develop things. And so one of the ways that we anticipate you know, expressing that commitment to the community if the project moves forward uh, is by supporting uh, some community initiatives. So this would be you know, to be determined later, uh, but just for example, we know that the Allegheny Land Trust, um, it either ha just has or is just about to close on its purchase of the, the former um, Churchill Valley Country Club site. Uh, and the land trust then will be in sort of further fundraising mode to raise money to develop the park and to maintain the park uh, on the Country Club site. So that's the type of investment that uh, Hillwood has made in other communities and would be would be interested in considering here. Uh, there are other things that they that they would be interested in considering also. For example, we know that there is uh, a lot of concern about the tree canopy in Churchill and on this site in particular. And so we'll talk more about that uh, during the presentation. Uh, but that's something else that Hillwood would be interested to talk more about is, you know, in addition to planting a really substantial number of trees on this site, how they can support additional tree planting in other parts of the borough. Uh, there's been some discussion or, or some interest expressed about a playground. That's another uh, type of investment that, uh, that Hillwood would be interested to talk about. Uh, so Hillwood's um, commitment to the community won't end on the day that, uh, that borough council um, you know, votes and, and hopefully um, approves the conditional use. That really will be the beginning when we start the construction and then demonstrate the, the depth of our ongoing commitment by supporting important community initiatives. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of other things we wanted to, we wanted to go through. Um, <clears throat> there, there has been some media coverage recently um, about a state grant uh, that Hillwood applied for. Uh, the grant is, is called um, RCAP, or some people refer to it as RACP. Uh, it stands for the Redevelopment Assistance Capital Program. This is a Pennsylvania state grant program that, that uh, the governor and the Department of Community and Economic Development administer. And so every year they um, award grants of close to $200 million uh, across the Commonwealth um, to, to help significant projects um, get underway. And uh, so the, the question uh, was raised in the context of, you know, Hillwood initially at the, uh, at the outset of this process commented that we did not intend to seek any uh, public financing incentives. And so the question then asked, was asked, like, what, wait a second, guys, you told us that, but then here you are applying for this grant, you know, what, what gives? Uh, so we, we recognize that. And so first, I just wanted to confirm that we did apply for a $10 million RCAP grant. That, that's accurate. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why we did that. Um, the first, I, I mentioned a moment ago, the 25% the increase across the board in construction costs. So that, that's a really extraordinary and unforeseen event. 
And so uh, what our role as the developer, we're trying to help manage the costs for our tenant. Uh, so that's one way that we um, tried to pursue managing those costs. The second thing is that when you apply for the grant, you have to indicate the specific purpose that the funds would be used for. And so the, the grant request relates to uh, demolishing the buildings, remediating the environmental contamination on the site, um, and also the offsite traffic improvements, which we'll go through those later in the presentation as well, and you'll see that they're significant. Uh, so, and our view is that those things are, are benefits to the community as well as to this project. Um, and um, just a, as a matter of procedure, so we, we have applied for this grant. Uh, the state hasn't yet um, issued awards for the 2021 um, RCAP process, so that's to be determined. So we don't know whether we will receive an award or not. Uh, if we do receive an award, the awards technically get made to a, a government agency, and then the developer is the so-called sub-grantee. So if this project um, didn't move forward for any reason, uh, then the government entity that's the recipient of that grant um, would uh, have the possibility of repurposing those grant funds for a future developer of this property. We think that that is, is meaningful and helpful uh, because uh, we know that the borough has seen a few other previous proposals to redevelop this property uh, that haven't worked. Uh, and these really substantial uh, remediation, demolition, and traffic costs are a significant reason for that. Uh, so these funds would be available as a potential resource um, to, to help the community and, and uh, either Hillwood or a future developer uh, navigate those challenges. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the story on the RCAP. Um, the, the next thing, and I'm getting, getting ready to be done um, talking, so we'll, we'll have some of our other, um, our, our other uh, participants um, address the planning commission as well. Uh, but in the, in the May planning commission meeting, there were about 20 questions uh, that were asked um, either by members of the public or by planning commission, and we wanted to um, respond to those. Um, in some cases, we've taken a couple of related questions and sort of combined them. Um, and so there are uh, questions about uh, traffic and about the um, sound studies that, that I'll address. And then I'll turn it over to Carly Davis um, from Langen, who will address the questions about stormwater, uh, the trees and environmental aspects of the site, um, and also the civil engineering. So you just forgive me as I, as I look down at my notes to make sure I get the questions right. Uh, the first question that was asked is about um, trucks idling on the site and what the rules are about how long trucks are allowed to idle. And uh, Pennsylvania has a state law. It's called the Diesel Powered Motor Vehicle Idling Act. And that act limits the amount of time uh, that trucks are allowed to idle to five minutes out of any 60 minute period. There are some exceptions to that, like if the, if the temperatures are extreme and, and some other things, but the general rule is five minutes out of any 60 minute period. Uh, in addition, the property owner is required to have signage on the site pointing out that restriction and to enforce it on the site. Uh, so that, that's the state law and, and we certainly will be uh, meeting that. The next question was whether there are any uh, you know, restrooms for the truck drivers on the site. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, there, are, there are restroom facilities for the truck drivers that they are free to use uh, once they have dropped off their, their uh, first truck and are, are waiting for a, a new tractor to, to be loaded. There was a question about whether trucks all wait on site or whether there will be trucks that are sort of queuing off site, like waiting, you know, in the berm along Greensburg Pike. Uh, and the answer is that all trucks will be on site. There's no off site truck queuing. Uh, there's a guard station on the site that enables trucks to come in. Uh, and so they will, they will be um, consistently moving the trucks through. Uh, so all trucks will be on site, whether they're Amazon trucks, whether they're third party trucks, they will all be uh, queuing on site. There was a question about the traffic study 
um, and how COVID has impacted it and whether a new traffic study is needed because, uh, because of COVID. Uh, the short answer is no, a new traffic study isn't needed. Uh, one of the main components of a traffic study is doing the counts of what the existing traffic is so that there's a basis for comparison. And uh, all of the traffic counts were performed pre-COVID, so when we had normal traffic levels. Uh, so um, I think that the general experience from COVID is that there's less traffic because more people are working from home, fewer people are going out or going into the office to work. Uh, so if there's any sort of a permanent shift toward less traffic, then that, that's great. That, that makes the traffic study even more, um, more valuable um, because the, it will be based on even more conservative assumptions about when there was more traffic than there may be in the future. Uh, so a new traffic study isn't needed. The, uh, the counts were done uh, pre-COVID. Earlier in the process, we were proposing a roundabout at the intersection of William Penn Highway and Beulah Road. Uh, and in the last meeting, a question was asked like, hey, what happened to the, to the roundabout? Uh, and so the, the answer is that um, during the traffic study process um, and during the planning commission process, um, there were enough um, questions that were raised both by the reviewing agencies and by members of public um, about the roundabout and its feasibility uh, that we heard those. And so the roundabout is no longer the preferred approach. Uh, so that that intersection at William Penn and Beulah Road will remain a, a signalized intersection. Um, but as Chris Prisk will um, explain later um, this evening, uh, there will be significant improvements um, to that intersection, both to mitigate traffic from this project and also uh, to help solve some longstanding uh, traffic challenges in the borough. One of the mitigations we had proposed at the intersection of Beulah Road and McCrady uh, was to have um, don't block the box signs and pavement markings like you might see uh, in Manhattan. And there was some skepticism expressed about that, um, about that solution and whether uh, drivers would um, adhere to that or not. Uh, so we, we have heard those concerns. And so one of the uh, mitigations that Chris will um, go through later is that we're now proposing that there'll be a, a full traffic signal at that intersection. So we know there's one there today that has you know, blinking red or blinking yellow, depending on your direction, but it would be a fully signalized intersection with uh, red, yellow, and green. Uh, a question was asked about the Greensburg Pike um, entrance to the facility and whether any uh, traffic improvements are planned there. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, we're, we're also proposing to have a traffic light um, at the rear entrance uh, so that um, traffic can go in and out um, of the rear entrance and also travel along Greensburg Pike um, uh, safely. Then there were a couple of questions about the sound and the, and the retaining walls, and then I'll turn it over to Carly after that. Uh, on the sound study, uh, a comment was made that the sound study ought to consider both the noise in the daytime and the noise in the nighttime, uh, and it does. The sound study already considers both daytime and nighttime noise. Uh, another question was whether the sound study includes sirens. Um, a, a member of the public commented that there are frequent sirens and that they're loud and was wondering how the, how the sound study handled those. Uh, and that the noise of sirens, I mean, that would have been registered uh, while we were taking sound measurements, um, but that's really an outlier sound. So that noise would have been excluded from the study. And what I mean by that is uh, for, to, to evaluate what the ambient noise is, any spikes from sirens would have been um, excluded so that we're, we're basing the existing ambient sound on you know, no, no sirens. And uh, the last comment was about the retaining walls. And there was a comment about you know, how they would sort of blend in um, with the natural surroundings. Uh, and so Carly will show this um, later while she's going through the landscaping. But there are, there are a couple of, of, uh, of benefits to the retaining walls and ways that we've tried to incorporate them into the um, natural feel of, of the site. Uh, as, as Carly mentioned in the May Planning Commission meeting, the retaining walls 
help us to save a significant number of trees, both on the west side of the site and on the east side of the site. And the reason is that if we didn't have the retaining wall to, to make a flat surface, then we would have to have a, a more extensive grading. Uh, and the area where that grading would occur is filled with trees. So the retaining wall allows us to keep all of the trees on the outside of the retaining wall. Uh, also having the retaining walls enables us to minimize the impacts on a stream that's on the western side of the site uh, closer to the to, closer to Greensburg Pike. Uh, also you'll see in the landscaping that we have added a, a significant number of trees to be planted along the base of all the retaining walls uh, so that they'll feel like a more natural component of the site. Uh, with that, Carly, I'll turn it over to you to start with uh, the stormwater questions. Great. Great. Thank you, Leif. So I'm just going to continue on with, with where Leif left off um, with stormwater comments from last, from last meeting. The need for a hydraulic study was identified. Um, we have performed a hydraulic and hy hydrologic study as part of our chapter 105 wetland and waterways permit, as well as just our normal permitting process through the borough and the DEP. Both reports have been submitted to both the borough and the DEP and are under review. Second question was what impact will diverting the water have? So I think in the last meeting, I had talked about how a significant portion of the site just sheet flows straight off into Beulah Road. And our development kind of creates not a wall, but it, it holds that water back. And then we push the water back into our site. That water then gets diverted back into the site, into the, the tanks that we've previously talked about and the stormwater ponds, which then help that slow release rate um, back onto Beulah that Leif talked about previously. So really the impact of diverting the water is that we're gonna see a significant reduction in the rate of runoff during these stormwater events that we analyze, and it's gonna improve the water quality because we're routing these through filters as well as the dry stormwater ponds that do provide a lot of um, nutrient removal. Um, Again, these facilities are approved by the DEP. They're standard facilities that we use and they are designed to meet and exceed all criteria of both the borough, the borough code and the Pennsylvania DEP. The need to evaluate the stormwater facility on the south end of the property was brought up. Um, we have performed an analysis of that weir structure. We've gone on site. I'll talk about that more later and show pictures. But in general, we, we see that there is a, a wood portion of this structure that looks to be a bit old. Um, we pr are proposing to replace that with either a nettle or concrete material for longevity. Um, we've also performed a hydrologic model of how that system functions as a as part of the entire site, and that will be submitted to the borough as an addendum to our stormwater report. Um, in general, the this facility, as well as all the stormwater facilities located on our site, are going to be a part of an operations and maintenance agreement that the developer will enter into the borough with. And basically, it's going to establish that Hillwood or whoever the end user and owner is um, will own and operate and maintain those facilities to the to their proper function. So we'll see the pictures. We know there's a lot of debris in that one structure. Things are overgrown. Part of that maintenance agreement is that um, we don't let it get to get to that point and then there could be issues. What impact or what will the stormwater impact will of the site grading be? So as Leif mentioned, we have a, we do have a good amount of retaining walls. Um, those retaining walls help us to not have as steep of slopes that then impact, as you as Leif mentioned, even more vegetate existing vegetation on the site. Um, the slopes that we do have are going to be engineered. They're going to be stabilized. Our geotechnical engineers actively involved in the project as well. Um, these are accounted for in our stormwater calculations. Um, we're very aware of you know, previous issues and we have a geotech on record who's going to be <clears throat> um, engineering any any slopes and retaining walls on site to make sure that we don't have to to make sure that they're engineered properly um the environmental section that 
was uh, kind of discussed in detail last meeting. What is the explanation for the 8 million to 18 million environmental remediation range? That was done by a hazardous material professional. Um, at the time of that evaluation or that estimate, they were not yet allowed in the building um, because of the current contamination that is ongoing. And so basically we're, we're establishing a range of how bad it can be and how, how little it could be. The primary concern is asbestos. So we have to take a lot of caution with that. Um, these buildings were built prior to having any sort of regulations on asbestos. So that's why we have this large range because the professional was not yet able at that point to really get in there and evaluate every nook and cranny of what we're seeing. Will site lighting endanger birds? So the site lighting was designed um, to be environmentally friendly. They're LED fixtures and they meet the definition of full cutoff per the International Dark Sky Association. So what that really means is the LED fixture kind of sits like this, the light shines down only. So there's no light that goes above the horizontal plane of that fixture. Um, in addition, the site, light, the site lighting on this site, um, typically we have poles that are about 40 feet high in, in the truck field to shine more light out, but we actually reduce that down to 24 feet per the borough, co per the borough code. Um, next one, Hillwood should expand studies to smaller trees, not just those 12 inches or greater in diameter. So this is in relation to the existing tree survey that we performed. We consulted with landscape architects um, within Langen, as well as Mr. Jarish, who performed the actual tree survey, and all were in agreement, um, and all actually even recommended that 12 inches uh, at, at DVH is a common standard for mature trees. The trees will not recover in our lifetime because they take 40 years to mature. We'll see in another slide. Uh, the existing, the existing trees on site, um, we have invasive species, we have species that are very disease prone and that are already diseased. And so it's just a matter of time before they themselves, healthy trees um, of the same species will also be diseased. And there's just a general lack of maintenance on the site. So not all of these trees um, that we see on site right now are healthy and mature, good trees. The trees that we're planting will be native species, they'll be healthy, and they'll be well maintained to reach that maturity. How many healthy trees will be lost? We have calculated out to be 290 mature quality trees that are in good condition will be lost, and we're proposing 1,032 native species trees. And we'll go, we'll, I'll show you um, that also in the, in the next few slides. Will this be a balanced site, neither taking cut off site nor bringing fill on, onto site? Yes, that is um, always our goal, especially in construction. We hauling dirt off site or having to import fill is a very expensive number, and we have a very large site with a lot of dirt available to us. And that also goes into retaining walls, um, the achieving a balanced site. Sometimes you can't do that with slopes. Retaining walls help you to do that. Can the building be pulled back from the eastern side of the site? Short answer to that is no. Um, we are confined on the west side of the site with a stream that goes back to needing that chapter 105 wetland and waterways permit, as well as what Leif mentioned earlier about the retaining wall up against that stream. So if we pulled that any bit further, we'd be going on top of it. We'd have more environmental impacts. We'd be taking out more trees, et cetera. So I, Leif, I think that's all the questions from last time. And now we're gonna go to traffic. Yep, that sounds great. Uh, Tim, if you could advance to the next slide and Chris Prisk, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Leif. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up, make sure my microphone's working okay? All right. Um, well, I've talked to a few different months now about different aspects of the traffic study and our, and our process. Um, tonight, we're gonna focus on two things primarily, 
just the truck information and then uh, just the overall improvements that we're doing all around the site. Um, so this first slide here is to illustrate the, the truck routing, proposed truck routing for the site. Um, so you see in green is the inbound truck route and in blue is the outbound truck route. Um, so coming from the parkway east from the city, uh, you can see this new off-ramp connection uh, where we're showing on average uh, about eight uh, inbound trucks per hour. Um, and so they come directly from the parkway. They're gonna use this new connection to a local road and enter the site. Um, so they're not going to be on any of the uh, surrounding area roadways. Coming from the east from Monroeville on the parkway, uh, you can see the green arrow uh, has five trucks on average per hour that would get off onto William Penn, uh, turn left on the Beulah, and then turn right um, on into the site. Um, Likewise, the reverse, if we stay on the east side, uh, would be the blue line. So they would exit the site on Dabula, um, head north. I'm on the other side, Tim, if that's you helping me out with the cursor. Thanks. Uh, head north on Beulah and then turn right to get back on to uh, the parkway. I know there was some questions before about, you know, would trucks be heading out on Churchill to access the parkway? Um, no, they would be heading up Beulah and then on to William Penn. And you can see that's, again, five uh, trucks uh, per hour. And then on the, on the east or back on the west side now, uh, the blue route that heads out to Greensburg Pike, um, that would be eight uh, trucks per hour that would head on Greensburg Pike and then head north to William Penn to get back on the parkway. Um, of those four movements, uh, you can see that uh, the one direct off-ramp never really touches local streets. Um, and then the movements to and from the east uh, are only on Beulah for a very short distance before they're in the site. Uh, and then coming out onto Greensburg Pike is the one movement uh, that would be coming out onto more local roads, if you will. Um, two other things to note on this is that there were some questions about truck traffic heading south, uh, maybe to future uh, developments or, or future needs heading south on either Greensburg Pike or Beulah. Um, and, and you can see that there's some weight limit postings uh, further south on both Greensburg Pike and Beulah Road that would prohibit those uh, truck routing that way. So that the truck routing that we're showing here uh, is the proposed routing that the facility is gonna use. We can go to the next slide, Tim. Um, what I wanted to, to point out here is there was some information uh, being discussed maybe in, in public forums uh, about how much truck traffic the facility was gonna generate. And so we wanted to just kind of break that down and, and show it to you um, from the source. Uh, so this is information provided by the end user client and we've broken it down into uh, four categories, which represent those four highlighted routes that we showed you on the previous graphic. So uh, entering traffic, which is the green, you know, from uh, 376 eastbound and then from 376 westbound. Uh, and you can see the hourly breakdown of, of what the truck traffic is anticipated to be. And then the total over the day. Uh, and then the, the egress or the exiting movement, uh, which is uh, the blue on the previous graphic. So out to 376 westbound and out to 376 eastbound. Um, we're, we're anticipating basically a 60-40 split, 60% uh, heavily weighted more towards uh, the city in the west, 40% uh, more towards Monroeville. Another thing to note is uh, 
you know, although this is the, the truck schedule that was provided by the client, the traffic study that we used uh, assumed a higher number of truck use. Um, that was just uh, some of the assumptions that were agreed upon with the various public agencies. Uh, so again, you know, the traffic study is, is more conservative. Leif already kind of spoke to the fact that the existing volumes are higher than what they currently are right now. Um, and the truck traffic that we used is, is higher than what we actually anticipate. Again, just to make sure we were overly conservative. Um, and then the, the last point on this is that, you know, 70% of what you're seeing here, kind of those three movements again, uh, really don't touch those, those local roads to speak of. So again, just to give you some context. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Tim? Um, this graphic is meant to kind of illustrate uh, the entirety of all the improvements that are proposed uh, from the traffic study. And I'll, I'll give you a little context first. So the, the circles with the numbers are the various intersections that we, we needed to evaluate um, that was agreed upon. And then we tried to identify the uh, ownership of that intersection or that particular roadway. Um, in some cases, you know, there's, there's multiple owners and we kind of deferred to maybe the, the highest in the hierarchy, right? So if, if it was a state route or a state route connection, PennDOT is listed. Um, if it was on a, a county road, you know, Allegheny County is listed. And then all these intersections are obviously in Churchill Borough. Um, so the borough has a say in them, but we, we tried to list the ownership. So that's what the color within those intersection circles indicate. The yellow highlighted area is areas where we're going to be, uh, you know, implementing some kind of improvements. Um, and I'm going to walk through that. Uh, right now, let's start on the the west side. Uh, so near intersection uh, six and seven, Greensburg Pike. Uh, what's what's being proposed is a, a road diet. Uh, so currently, there are there are two lanes each direction on Greensburg Pike, um, and to provide a a left turn lane, a center left turn lane. A, a road diet is essentially restriping the existing pavement, which has two lanes each direction, to be one lane each direction and a two-way left turn lane in the center. And then you could either have, you know, excess shoulder on either side, or perhaps it's a, a bicycle trail or a pedestrian trail. Um, or you could restripe to have two lanes in one direction, one lane in the other with a turn lane. But the, the concept basically is to use the existing pavement width that you have, but restripe it to serve more functionality. Um, and that, that two-way left turn lane we're showing right now uh, to kind of start from Graham to the north and then head down um, just within the, the borough limits. And so that left turn lane will serve a, a few different businesses along that stretch and provide a safety benefit. Intersection seven uh, is the proposed exit for uh, the site to Greensburg Pike. And although we, we met one warrant uh, for a traffic signal, typical traffic signal installation requires multiple warrants. Um, in, in this case, you know, at the, at the borough's request, uh, we're gonna install a traffic signal at this location. So I just want to show how we're kind of going above and beyond what's typically required. So at intersection seven would be a new traffic signal. Um, just off of intersection six uh, kind of shows this new off-ramp uh, connection. And we've been working with PennDOT pretty closely uh, so that this new off-ramp needs to come and hit a local road. And then from that local road, our site can have access. I know some of the earlier questions was, you know, why can't you have direct interstate access to and from your site? Um, FHWA doesn't allow that. Uh, so the 
you know, the, the ramp to a local road and then a local road connection to our site. Um, so that's what's occurring there. As you keep uh, going up counterclockwise, uh, intersection number five, um, there's going to be some uh, signal phasing uh, changes uh, so that the northbound right turn from Graham to William Penn can occur when the westbound left turn from William Penn to Graham is occurring. Uh, it's an overlap phase. Again, our, our traffic study didn't indicate that that improvement needed to be made, but at the request of PennDOT, uh, the developer was agreeable to doing that. Along William Penn, that yellow highlighted area on either side of intersection four uh, is, is another kind of restriping effort uh, where there's two lanes each direction, um, but left turn lanes are, are technically warranted right now. Um, and so PennDOT has requested that we restripe those lanes to have a left turn lane and a through lane um, in each direction. And so we're gonna be restriping that effort. Uh, again, this is addressing a, an existing issue, um, not a proposed uh, issue. And then as we keep going further over to intersection uh, eight, McCrady, uh, the traffic study really indicated that there were um, not significant enough impacts to that intersection to warrant uh, any kind of mitigation. Uh, we were initially proposing, you know, some signage and some pavement markings. We thought that would improve conditions because we heard, um, you know, some some complaints raised about traffic conditions at that. Uh, and then through working with uh, the borough, uh, most recently, uh, you know, we're gonna be pursuing installing a, a, a fully actuated traffic signal there uh, that would accommodate McCrady. Again, not because the study shows that we need to, but just that, you know, we're trying to go above and beyond to address concerns. Um, as you go down to intersection three, that was the location that initially was the preferred roundabout. Uh, and now it's gonna remain signalized, um, but we're gonna be adding some additional lanes to provide additional capacity. Uh, so a eastbound right turn lane, a westbound left turn lane, a small northbound right turn lane. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna have a graphic later on that shows a little bit more detail on this, but. Uh, just know that there's going to be, you know, additional lanes, which provides more capacity so cars can get through the intersection faster, which improves operations. Uh, and then as you come down uh, in between three and two, uh, there's going to be a little bit of, of proposed widening, I guess, if you will. Um, and then when you hit intersection two, one of the, one of the issues that was uh, brought to our attention an existing condition is the Churchill right turn movement that heads north onto Beulah. Um, again, our, our traffic study doesn't indicate that we would need to address that um, because of our development, because uh, our, our development isn't taking that movement. Um, but as, as part of this kind of collaborative process uh, and been working with the borough's engineer, you know, we're coming up with a solution that can address that condition and actually looking to possibly relocate the intersection uh, a little bit further south to provide more room in between intersections two and three and to eliminate that kind of free flow right turn movement that, that causes some uh, congestion. Um, this stretch here on Beulah that we've been in coordination with the borough's engineer, uh, we're getting ready to present that back to PennDOT. Um, and so we're, we're gonna need to get PennDOT's buy-in, make sure that the, you know, the county and PennDOT, all those different agencies are in agreement. Uh, so you know, these, these solutions I'm discussing specifically just on this Beulah corridor here you know, are, are fairly new um, and we are gonna have to get a final sign off from PennDOT because it is a state route. Intersections two and three, uh, typically if you could reuse the existing signal uh, with the development, you would, 
um, but the boroughs requested uh, via via PennDOT that those signals be upgraded. So we're going to install brand new signals at two and three, um, just to kind of you know again show that that we're going above what would typically be required. And then Tim, if you can go to the last one, so I can give them a better look at uh, what we're looking at for Beulah. Okay, now this is a, a screen capture from one of the software tools that we use to analyze traffic. So the, the northernmost intersection with McCready, uh, no lane changes there, but that's where we're looking at installing a fully actuated traffic signal, which would allow for McCready to exit uh, under a protected signal phase. Then as you head south to William Penn, uh, there's a eastbound right turn lane that would be new. Um, there's an additional westbound left turn lane on William Penn so that two left turn lanes could turn from William Penn south on Nebula. There's a small little extended northbound right turn lane from Beula to William Penn. As you keep going further south, we'd be widening the southbound approach before the Churchill intersection so that you had two through lanes and an exclusive left turn lane, an exclusive right turn lane. You can kind of see from the background image where um, the model shows that the intersection's getting pulled a little bit further south than what's currently there. So you can see the, you know, the background image of Churchill and the current driveway and how we're trying to pull it a little bit further south to make room for some of this widening and to kind of pull back that right turn from Churchill. Um, and then as you go a little bit further south, uh, you know, there would be an additional widening to kind of receive those two southbound lanes. Um, so this latest concept alternative, you know, is, is, is hot off the press, if you will, uh, through collaboration, again, with the borough's engineer. Um, we do need to submit it to PennDOT um, to, to get their approval on this. Uh, so not entirely sure if this is, you know, 100% what's, what's going to occur, but we just wanted to share the direction that we were heading. Um, and I believe that that covers everything that I wanted to touch on, Tim. Uh, now it right. might be back to Carly, yeah. Unless you're going to talk about stormwater. <laughs> That's all you. Okay. All right. Um, so we wanted to do another stormwater summary and just go into a little bit more detail than the, the question and answer at the beginning of, of this presentation. So on the screen is just a schematic of our proposed improvements, but also showing you where the existing improvements are. Um, we call those BMPs, that stands for best management practices. It's a term that the DEP uses a lot and you see that from state to state, um, but it kind of covers everything from underground storage facilities to wet ponds to dry ponds and other mechanisms. So we wanted to point out that Currently on site, there are two BMPs. First of which is the pond that everyone can see um, when you're on the interstate. And then the second one is on the southern edge of the site that is actually beyond the limits that we're actually disturbing. So we're looking at about 107 acres of actual disturbance, whereas this facility is located to the south of that, um, beyond that, that limit. Um, but we were asked to evaluate it. So we did look at it and we talked about those improvements. Um, so really what we're showing here though, is that both of those BMPs are still staying and it's still gonna be functioning. We're relocating and modifying the existing pond a bit, but we're also adding five more best management practice facilities. Three of those are underground storage tanks that we've talked about. And then we're adding an additional two above ground wet ponds. The underground tanks help with both volume and rate control. 
And then the pawns themselves help with rate control and quality control that Leif talked about. And then in addition, what we don't have on the screen is we also have jellyfish filters that are an engineered filter um, that actually are located upstream of the tanks. So the water's coming into the tanks, it gets cleaned beforehand, enters the tanks, then the tanks go to each of these ponds where there's even more nutrient removal. Um, a couple questions from last time that I did want to address are the material of the underground tank. So the tanks are made of corrugated metal pipes in just in rows. The ones on this side are, are up to nine feet in diameter. So it's corrugated metal, but it's also dipped in type two aluminum. So that type two aluminum forms a bond with the steel and it has a longevity of up to 75 years, um, according to some of the scientific papers we've seen. And then in addition, another question was basically what the construction sequence of these are, or how do we, how do we know that these aren't gonna fail or you know, along the lines of how do we know they're not gonna collapse in on themselves um, due to the underground surface. So the construction of these is actually very similar to that of a building or really any sort of like parking lot. What you'll see is a big hole gets, um, gets dug. And then on the bottom of this hole, you have a four to six inch layer of bedding, which kind of provides that foundational support that you'd see basically of a building. The, the empty pipes get laid on top and then in between the pipes, a granular material. So you're, you know, usually we see a stone, uh, maybe like a, an Ashto 57, maybe something smaller, um, gets filled in between and then compacted. So just very similar to what you'd see on a proof roll of a building foundation before the slab goes in. So we're compacting those stones down to provide support for the pipes as well as um, the foundation underneath. Then on top of that, we have more compaction. Um, it's located a certain number of feet underneath the asphalt surface so that we don't have to worry about when the trucks come over, any sort of failure. Um, so the pipes themselves are H20 loaded. H20 is just a common term for basically heavy traffic. Um, it can withstand, you know, multiple time, multiple um, semi-trailers coming over it at once. Um, so the pipes themselves are strong enough to not to collapse, but also the undermining ground, we make sure is strong enough to support the material itself. And then another item that can sometime that we've seen um, when flowable fill is used for the to backfill in between the pipes is that we need to think about buoyancy, but the weight of the pipes themselves prevent the pipes from actually popping up. Um, you'll see that, and we, we don't have a groundwater issue out here. You see that a lot with groundwater with groundwater issues, especially in the south, but not an issue here. Um, these are engineered. They are, you know, we have a professional engineer who signs and seals the, the manufacturing of these and just the a general design and intent. So they're putting their, their stamp on it that these things, that these will not fail as long as all construction methods are, are followed. And we see these all over the country. It's a very typical method of stormwater management. Um, so we feel very confident that this is a, a good use for this site. So next slide, please. So one of the things that I wanted to try to highlight is, you know, we were hearing we're hearing about the flooding. And so we wanted to try and visualize how much water is actually going to be held back in these storm events. So if we look at an Olympic sized swimming pool, that's 164 feet long by 82 feet wide by six and a half feet deep, that's about 660,000 gallons um, of water. So next slide, please. When we look at each of the storm events that we need to look, that we need to analyze, which are the one year through 100 year 24 hour storm events, every storm event produces an X amount of water. It comes into those pipes and then it starts to fill up. 
So in every one of these storm events, we fill up higher and higher and higher. And then we have different levels in which the, waters get, the water gets let out. So at the peak, so in the one year storm event, at its peak height within the tank, 955,000 gallons are being held back and slowly released. So those 955,000 gallons aren't rushing off the site uncontrolled. They're being held back and released at a controlled rate. When we get all the way up to the 100 year storm, so again, now we're filling up even higher within our, within our tank, you're at over 2 million gallons. That's equivalent to over three Olympic sized swimming pools. So just imagine all of that water is no longer rushing off or going through two BMPs. It's now being funneled through seven. That's what helping, that's what helping is also helping our rate control, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. So as Leif mentioned earlier, we are in a, the code requires us to reduce the, the rate control or reduce our runoff rate at the peak by 20%. And that's governed by being in the Thompson Run watershed. So we have various watersheds within Pennsylvania. And you know, when we look even beyond that within the country, specifically our site is located within Thompson Run watershed. And when we look at this map, this basically tells us that wherever we're located, it tells us what our allowable release rate is. So you can see where the site's located. Um, we're in the yellow. So that corresponds to an 80% release rate, meaning we're required to release 80% of what the existing is or bring that down by 20%. So when we actually look at our numbers and we, you know, ultimately all three points combine to one point in Beulah Road. So when we look at that on the next slide, for every storm event, we actually exceed that 20% by over, by at least 10% in every storm event. So in our one year storm event, we're actually reducing it by 31% rather than the required 20. When we look at the two year, we actually reduce it by half. Same for the five year and then beyond the five year, we're at about a 40% reduction rate. So we're double what the requirement is for those more extreme storm events. Again, that goes back to those large tanks, holding the water back and then slowly releasing it in order to meet these rates. Next slide, please. We talked about water quality. We're required to meet the existing water quality requirements. That's all that we're required to do by state code. So the way that we kind of, well, the way that this is calculated is we look at the use. So a pavement surface that uses heavy highway is going to have a higher higher nutrient loading than a forest. So that all gets taken into account in these calculations. So a key thing to yeah. You know, I know everyone's probably is, how is this possible that it's being reduced by so much? A key factor is that roofs do not generate any nitrogen, phosphorus, or suspended solids. A roof is a clean area. It's the cars and the trucks that are causing a lot of, uh, that cause this. So just by the mere fact that we're, our square footage is what it is, that's helping the reduction, but the bigger reduction comes in the use of the dry ponds. So what you can see here is using the same method that we used to calculate the pre, we calculate the post, and we have a 77% reduction in nitrogen and a 93% reduction in phosphorus. Why these two pieces are important is that these nutrients actually kill the oxygen once they get into surface waters. And that oxygen is what, when that oxygen gets eaten up, that's when you see the algae blooms, and that's not very good for fish. So it's a key thing that's really regulated nationwide uh, that nitrogen and phosphorus are key nutrients to remove. Another one that we have to remove is total suspended solids. So that's just simply the dirt that you see. Um, it's usually particulates that are much smaller. You really can't see them to the naked eye, but by the use of the dry ponds and the tanks, that settles it out. And then it don't, doesn't enter the water system of the state. So, at a minimum, we decrease pollutants of nitrogen by 70%, 77%, and then 93% for the other two. And this is based on a two-year storm. 
so the water generated within a pretty common storm, a two year event, these are the levels that we're gonna get out of this. Also, these do not take into account the removal efficiencies that we get from the jellyfish filters. Those are an added bonus to us. So I think the next one, okay. So talking about the existing BMP improvements, this, it, these are pictures of that BMP that's located downstream of our site, um, well beyond the limit of anything that we're disturbing. However, we, we totally understand that this is within the, the owner's maintenance responsibilities. So we, we, you can very well see that this is overgrown. There's substantial debris in it. So not only are we agreeing to clean this up as, on a long-term basis and a current basis, um, we're also going to be replacing that wooden structure you see right in the middle of the concrete portion. Um, it's really, it, that appears to be a weir that's, got, that's helping to control the stormwater rate, um, just like we're doing on our site. However, we see that it's wooden. It, you know, we can see water coming through the planks. So we're proposing, yep. So we're proposing to replace that with either a concrete or steel pipe, or I'm sorry, concrete or steel plate going to have longer longevity and won't have to have as much concerns about water running through it and, you know, eventually deteriorating that wood. Um, again, we will be entering into a, or I'm sorry, the developer will be entering into an operations and maintenance agreement over every facility that's within the site, including this one. And that is an agreement that the borough has with with a developer that the developer is responsible for ongoing maintenance of not only this facility, but all the other facilities that we've talked about. I think next is landscape, oh, I'm sorry, site lighting. So another area that we, um, that's of concern for the residents we understand is site lighting. So the borough code states that at any property line, you can have 0.25 foot candles. Um, of light spillage. What this is showing is the areas in blue are where we have foot candles that are in point in the point 0.1 to point 0.2 range. So we're nowhere near most property lines and we're already below the minimum standard um, below the minimum standard. The gray area is where we're at zero. So there is no light within any of those areas from our LED fixtures that we have on site again, just shining down. Um, there zero percent of any property line that abuts a residential property has any light spillage. So against every property line that you see here that's against a residential has a foot candle level of zero. Everything internal to the site is lit to the levels needed by our client. Um, but again, you can see that there's a drop off pretty much within right after the boundary of our site and the roadway network, we drop off to zero, which is above the code standard. So landscaping, um, also understood this is a high concern for the residents and we wanted to, we want to you know, make sure that we're addressing this. So in the March version of the landscaping plan and the rendering that you see here, we had proposed 555 trees of nine different species. As of the submittal last week, next slide, we are now proposing 1,032 trees of 16 different species. And I think you can tell from the plan itself, and as Leif mentioned earlier, that we've really beefed up the trees along retaining walls and along the perimeter of the site to block, you know, to provide a little bit more view blockage. Um, we've also increased the density of trees in their locations. And we've added more trees also to the southwest side of the site, um, again, to help with those, um, to help with those sight lines. So again, increase the tree density along the interstate, along retaining walls, and along Beulah Road. So we also talked about um, the tree survey that was that we did for the last meeting. Code minimum is one tree per five parking spaces. So that equates to about 317 trees. We're three times that of what we're proposing, 
three times the code minimum. In addition, we recognize that there's 290 mature, good, healthy trees that we'd be removing. So we're almost double the amount combined on that. But again, three times the code minimum proposal. And then we wanted to give a more graphical representation of the tree survey results. So what this basically relates to is trees that were identified in the good, fair, poor condition, ones that were already dead, trees that are diseased, that are either already diseased or disease prone and would eventually become diseased and die, and the, and the invasive species. So the, the, the 16 species that we're proposing on site, none of which are invasive, none of which are, are disease prone. And there's a, we submitted the tr a, a formal tree survey summary to the borough as well. And I believe, Tim, do you have the rendering view? I don't know if that's. Oh. Which view are you thinking of, Carly? The one from Be from Beulah Road towards the access road. Tim, is that something that you have? Perfect. All right. Okay, so again, this is a larger view of what we just looked at. Again, want to point out the density of trees that we've increased and then the location around retaining walls, around sound walls. And then in, in particular, we wanted to show you this view from Beulah. So the current view So existing view. The view at the time of planting. We want to point out the attention to providing tree screening at the top of this slope to try to help screen the actual the, the sound wall, to help screen the screen sound wall. And then 10 years, next slide. A little bit more mature, grown up, really can't see anything. I think that that's, don't believe that I have anything else. Thanks, Please. Carly, that, that, was, that was very helpful, we appreciate it. Uh, so just in closing, we wanted to thank everyone again for, for being with us and for your attention. Um, the, uh, the focus, of our presentation tonight, in addition to trying to show graphically some of the improvements and the mitigation measures that we're proposing, uh, is to focus on the places where we're meaningfully exceeding what the requirements are. Uh, as the solicitor mentioned at the at the beginning of the meeting, um, the, the, the way that the conditional use process works is that uh, there are six or seven conditions that we need to satisfy and so the sort of legal process is to look at each one and determine whether the developer has satisfied it or not. And I know that there has been some reaction from residents of, listen, we don't want this to be a box checking exercise. Like, you know, we live here and so we hear that. And so what we've tried to demonstrate is the ways in which we're not just trying to squeak over the, the minimum level past the, the, the requirement that 
we're really going meaningfully above and beyond um, that requirement and at considerable expense, um, but to, to try to make this feel like something that fits into the community and to address the concerns uh, that have been raised. So we hear those, we hear your concerns, we're earnestly listening, uh, we're, we're trying to address them the best that we can, and we, we hope that that comes across. Uh, I also just wanted to mention that the, the way that this process works, is, as uh, the solicitor described, it's sort of a back and forth uh, between the engineers on both sides. Uh, both Langen and Gateway are really elite level national engineering firms. Uh, the sort of gold standard for rating engineering firms is something called the engineering news record. So every year they publish a list of the top 500 design firms and both Langen and Gateway are on that list. That's sort of like a stock being on the New York Stock Exchange. So there are just exemplary engineers who are handling this project, both for the developer uh, and also for the borough. Uh, so we're, we're proud of that and, and we hope that that work shows uh, and uh, Tim, unless you have anything else, I, I think that wraps up our, our presentation and we'll welcome uh, questions and comments from, from Planning Commission. Tim, you're muted. Sorry about that. No, not, nothing more to add, Leif. Um Again, appreciate everybody's time this evening and uh, look forward to the questions and comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the uh, presentation. At this time, um, I'm going to invite the Gateway Engineer to um, ask questions, make a presentation, tell us where they are in the review process. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the applicant did cover kind of a, a lot of the progress where they stand in terms of submissions as well as uh, questions that uh, that they are working on and answering. Uh, we do continue to review the studies and plans submitted by the applicant. Um, in accordance with the conditional use application requirements uh, of the borough as well as just standard engineering uh, practice, uh, to ensure that all the impacts created by the development are adequately uh, mitigated. Um, again, the applicant went through a number of those uh, studies uh, in regards to lighting, air quality, and sound. Um, those studies uh, uh, were reviewed by subconsultants who specialize in each of those areas. Um, those subconsultants provided numerous comments back to the applicant and the applicant has uh, satisfied the majority of those comments. Um, with that, there will be some discussion regarding, um, regarding additional studies to be performed following, um, following the completion of the, of the work and of the, of the development and um, actual occupancy and usage to ensure that you know, the uh, expectations that were provided now are actually met. Um, with that, um, uh, there are some additional uh, revisions and comments outstanding for both uh, stormwater and traffic. Uh, the applicant did uh, hit on a number of those items here today as they discussed it. A uh, partial resubmission was made in the last month uh, for, for a number of the stormwater comments. Um, with that, we did provide a, an additional stormwater comment letter. Uh, the outstanding items there primarily are focusing on the downstream BMP that they mentioned and additional modeling that would be required uh, uh, for that. Um, as well as uh, ensuring that they would be providing um, operation and maintenance for all, uh, all site facilities, which is standard, uh, standard practice and also would be required by the Allegheny County Conservation District and the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, uh, also, another item to be addressed regarding stormwater is uh, the runoff of the driveway to be installed for the existing uh, Westinghouse facility, which is to remain, and that, uh, that driveway is expected to connect onto Beulah Road. Uh, there's uh, some additional items which need to be addressed uh, along there as well. Um, 
Otherwise, uh, regarding traffic, uh, we did not receive a formal submission in the last month. Um, uh, we have continued to try to uh, answer any questions from the applicant uh, in, regarding the, uh, in regards to those outstanding comments. Um, and once a formal submission is received, we will review it, provide any, any further outstanding comments and uh, continue to work with um, the uh, work with PennDOT to ensure that a traffic impact study is, uh, is reviewed and approved. With that, uh, one other item to mention um, is that th this is again, just review of the conditional use items. We do have a number of outstanding land development uh, comments and uh, that process will still remain and there will be a number of items that will be uh, addressed and revised based on the, the general land development comments. Um, and then also with the status of the project and we, we have kind of reiterated that to the applicant to provide the status of their applications for any necessary permits. There are third party uh, re uh, review agencies which must review this um, in addition to the reviews that are being performed by Gateway and its sub consultants, um, specifically uh, submissions for stormwater to DEP, uh, as well as the um, conservation district. And those will be. Uh, conditions of, of potential, uh, potential approval. Um, so that would not be something that we would expect for them to have right now, but they have shown that they have started that process, uh, that that would need to be reviewed if there was anything that we did have to come back to this point and any revisions that would need to be made to the plans as they do, uh, as they do stand now, additional review would be completed at that time. Um, with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any other uh, questions um, from the Planning Commission um, and we'll, we'll continue to pass along any comment letters that we have in the time being. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate the update. Um, at this time, we will move on to uh, questions or uh, issues from the Planning Commission. Um, if anybody would uh, like to ask Hillwood any questions of the uh, members of the Planning Commission, now's your time. I've got a few thoughts, Madam Chair. Please. Thank you. I, in no particular order, and apologies if some of these aren't, are more for land development, but Everything is, is fairly related. Um, I really appreciate all the, the effort with the, with the tree study and the increase in, in quantity and, and um, native species. Um, I, I just uh, want to um, mention an observation that, you know, even though there's only 290 good trees, mature good trees um, that are going to be removed, there's, there's still another thousand trees that are fair, poor, or disease prone. That doesn't mean they're diseased yet, but um, so doing the math, it, 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 you know, the, it's not a one-to-one -one replacement, which was, which was my hope. And I understand the, the, the reason to focus on the 290, but I would, uh, I, I would love to see some more trees put in is, is the bottom line. And I hope um, it, listening to the, the information about the stormwater being maintained, um, hopefully there's a, a, a good maintenance um, schedule in place by the, by the owner or the tenant to, to maintain the trees too, because sticking them in the ground is only part of the effort. Um, I've seen a lot of very nice landscaping um, deteriorate and be improperly maintained and and really sadly deteriorate faster than they, they should over the years. So I hope that doesn't happen here. Um, so uh, another thought I had was the, our, our, new, our new borough road that's gonna skirt around the property alongside the, the, the parkway. Um, I, I'd really like to see, I know this was discussed a little bit and there's a sidewalk being provided <clears throat> from Bueller Road 
up to the front door, but it, it would be really nice to um, be able to walk along that road. There's a lot, gonna be a lot of nice trees. If, if that sidewalk could be extended to Greensburg Pike somehow, now that the, um, the uh, slip ramp is farther away from the parkway and closer to Greensburg Pike, I don't know if there's enough room there between the property lines to, to squeeze that in, but that, that would be really nice to be able to walk along there and maybe ride a bike and, and connect from Greensburg Pike over to Beulah and, and then I presume the sidewalk up under the parkway will be maintained somehow even though the roads are widened and be able to get to that bus stop. Um, so that was another thought and on the lighting I realized that the that the photometric studies for exterior lights um, I don't, I don't believe they, they take into account for exterior lighting uh, reflected light and, and there was some concern I think I heard brought up about um, reflected light off, off the building and I was going to suggest it's, it's a very simple thing. I, I see that, that the perimeter, the lights around the perimeter of the property have house side shields on them, um, but I'd like to suggest that the ones that are wall mounted to the building also have house side shields because even though the photometrics of the fixture are our forward throw, um, there's still some backwash on there and and um, and I'd, it'd be best, I think, if, if the lighting pretty much just went down and didn't bounce off the building. Um, so some more house side shields and, and, and then there's also glare shields that can be added to the light fixtures around the perimeter of the property. Um, so I'd, I'd like to suggest that too, that's a simple thing. Um, I presume future things to look forward to would be um, seeing what the designs for the concrete uh, uh, sound walls and the retaining wall look like. There, I know there's a myriad of options there and i um, curious to, to see how, how nice they'll look. Uh, and I was also hoping to, to learn more about the, the building design, although I know that's not a land development thing, but um, you know, this is, this is gonna be, um, uh, a, a very big thing for the borough and, and it would be nice to know that uh, it's something to be proud of and it, in terms of energy, some sort of certification, be it Energy Star or I, I know you're not pursu pursuing LEED or anything like that, but something just a little bit more tangible to point to and say, hey, we, we've got a really top-notch building here um, and beyond just the, the regular building code and energy conservation code. There's also the green building code, which is optional. So there's a lot of different things and maybe that's future discussions to be had. Um, and then a couple months ago, there was some um, presentations on uh, three-dimensional modeling of the building, which it was nice to see that it's, it's not just this big chunk that there's some variations to the massing, but I wasn't sure if it was just a, a preliminary design, more of a massing model. I was, I was hoping for some little bit more visual interest um, it's, a, it's a big thing on the landscape and I, I, I don't know that it needs, it's going to ever blend in, but just something more visually intriguing um, as something to represent the community would, would be as opposed to just a block. Um, I, you know, hopefully, hopefully there's a NAIOP award in, in our future or your future or something like that. So, um, so those were some of my thoughts. Um, a lot of good, a lot of my questions were, were answered with tonight's presentation. It was very, very helpful. So thank you for all those efforts. Thank you, Mike. Any, anybody else on the commission? I have, I have a question um, and maybe, I don't know if this is for Dennis. Um, you, they had talked about the traffic uh, and all the improvements, the traffic configuration and the improvements being somewhat a new design. How long uh, do you anticipate that it'll take to get uh, PennDOT approval for all the improvements? Um, it, Kyle, Kyle Brown from our office may be on as well to speak to this a little bit further since he has been working directly with PennDOT. Um, ultimately, just for the review of the study portion, uh, it typically is at least a 30-day review process from the date in which that is applied for. The HOP process or highway occupancy permit process that they will need to go through will be much longer than that and will review these 
individual um, as, uh, as the applicant kind of went through and described those individual improvements at intersections, those as far as their construction um, it, and exactly how they'll be constructed, that will all need to be reviewed, scrutinized and, and approved. So that is on a different schedule, but at the same time would be a condition of approval. So again, they would not be able to start construction without having, um, having those approvals in place as well. Uh, Kyle, if, if you're on, if you have any other specific comments regarding that. Uh, no, I would just say, yeah, the, the, as far as the recommendations that they put forward today in tonight's presentation, um, you know, upon submission to PennDOT, it is a 30-day review window. So that's when we would expect uh, any form of comments or approval from PennDOT is uh, 30 days after that submission. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on the planning commission? Questions, comments? Uh, yes, um, Daniel's idle here. I'm having a problem with my camera. I apologize for that. Um, so I just, I, I, I uh, don't wanna take up too much time here because I know there's a lot of people in the community that have questions. Uh, number one, I just wondered, could, you, could someone explain to everyone um, on these traffic signals, how is that going to be coordinated? Um, you know, you've, you've got the uh, trucking coming in and coming out on, on a schedule, uh, which I wasn't sure, is that just Monday through Friday or is that Monday through Sunday? Um, but that's one question. The other question is, how are the uh, traffic signals going to be coordinated? Are these electric eyes or are they some kind of video control? How's that going to be handled? Um, I, I could take that. Um, I think those would be details that would be ironed out in that HOP process that would follow the traffic study approval. Um, however, you know, typically any new traffic signal these days would have a radar detection for the um, detecting the presence of vehicles. Um, but as far as the, the signals talking to each other and being coordinated, those could be a, a myriad of ways, just time-based uh, with GPS or, or any number of ways, but that, that those details will be ironed out in the, the next phase of this with the HOP process with us and, and uh, PennDOT. And as far as the uh, truck schedule, um, um, where it was, you know, so many coming in and leaving per day, um, is, that, is that seven days a week or is that five or what would that be? Chris, Chris, can you respond to that, please? Sure. Uh, it's my understanding that it's uh, seven days a week. Okay. All right. That's all I defer to the other members in the community. Any. Uh, Dick, do you have anything? No, I don't have anything right now. Thank you. Okay. Then at this time, uh, we will go for uh, comments from the Churchill Borough residents and the taxpayers. Uh, similar to the other meetings, uh, we would uh, like you to raise your hand. Alex will let you in, um, give your name, your um, address, and again, this is for borough residents only and taxpayers. Um, you're limited to three minutes uh, for your comments. And uh, due to the amount of people here, uh, we will be strict in, in the three minute time frame. And uh, as we stated before, if we can, you know, we'd like to have the comments that are uh, centered on the presentation. Madam Chair, I'd like to also add, in addition, uh, we will not be going back and forth this evening, so you're welcome to ask questions and be very specific with those questions, but we will not stop your time to respond, nor will we necessarily be responding tonight, though we leave that up to the applicant or the planning commission or you, Madam Chair, to, to respond to particular things at the end of the presentations. Uh, first, and I do apologize if I say your name wrong, and I will cut you off at three minutes. 
So it's no offense. It just when three minutes happens, I'll, I'll give you the stop sign. And um, I apologize in advance for those rude uh, activities that I end up having to perform. Uh, Cheryl, Alex, Alex, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if, if I could, if I recall correctly, the borough's policy is to also accept written comments uh, due to the time constraints of these types of meetings. Is that still the case? Very much. Tremendous way to do it because you can be very specific and we can share them to not only the planning commission, the borough, as well as the engineers who are reviewing the plans. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Cheryl McAbee, uh, you're first up. So go ahead and unmute yourself and then I'll start the timer. Please say your full name and your address. Thank you. Cheryl McAbee, 2005 Garrick Drive. In the presentation during our last meeting, the sound study was conducted on Greensburg Pike at 5 a.m. in the morning. It should have been done on a place like Beulah Road at 5 p.m. No one is on Greensburg Pike at 5 a.m. to make noise. Second, the earlier reports were submitted by individuals that said they were professional engineers in places like New Jersey and Oregon. Which of these reports requires an engineering stamp or seal? Those that require stamps or seals, does Pennsylvania accept engineers registration from these non-Pennsylvania states? Third, I see that they have figured out how to bring the um, entrance into a uh, county road, so I'll skip that. Um, also, I was surprised to see in that one picture that we still have Jersey barriers that will be on Greensburg Pike. Uh, those Jersey barriers are never been allowed to be there in the first place. And I see in Washington County when they have something like that, at least the Jersey barriers are clean and pristine and brand new concrete. They don't have, you know, yellow on them and red, uh, white on them and so forth. And so I hope you can find some New Jersey barrier someplace. And also on Garrett Drive, uh, there are 17 homes here that their backyards caved in back in the late 60s, I believe. And it was a terrible thing. And they had to go and put a storm uh, drain down to these 17 homes down to keep the water from flowing down on Beulah Road below us. OK, uh, right now that's not working because the home below me has uh, sandbags in their backyard trying to keep the water out. So I think somebody should look into that. And finally, uh, Westinghouse brings all their nuclear failures from around the world to this 10 acres it retained here in Churchill. Now, I don't know if this is still going on. I haven't heard anything of anybody talk about it. But anyways, due to um, Westinghouse not being able to get permits to go up to Cranberry, they still bring those failures here to Churchill. Uh, the map sent out by Churchill entitled the proposed project is extremely um, well, it doesn't show where Westinghouse is. You cannot read the street name. So I am asking, where is the 10 acres of Westinghouse on that map? Has Westinghouse been consulted? Has the Nuclear Regulatory Commission agreed that this is a use that should be next to Westinghouse? I say this because I am worried about terrorism. Our former police chief during a routine traffic stop less than a thousand feet from the entrance to this proposed facility pulled over a person on the terrorist watch list that US Homeland Security had lost track of and could not find. Homeland sent Churchill a letter of commendation. They were so happy our police had located that person for them. This is serious, okay? Amazon attracts drivers, many people from countries that spawn terrorism and uh, terrorists. So we need Homeland Security, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Westinghouse to put in writing they approve of this use for this facility. And that's all I have. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, next. Uh, Kathy Owen oh, Frank, please. Kathy, unmute yourself and, and name and address. Kathy Cohen Frank, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and name and address, please. Okay, we'll go on to Nicolette Armstrong. Nicolette, can you please um, unmute yourself and name and address? Go ahead and try unmuting yourself again. Yes, hi there. My name is Kathy Frank. I'm a 2010 Garrick Drive. Let me get my uh, video working here. Okay. Um, I would like to discuss the traffic plans, which seem to be up in the air at this moment, seeking approval. Um, I think if, if uh, 790 tractor trailers are gonna be coming and going from this plant every two minutes, we're gonna have a real problem. The Clean Air Act requires the EPA to set national air standard qualities 
for particulate matter as one of six criteria pollutant considerations harmful to the, to the health and the environment. The law also requires the EPA to periodically review the standards to ensure that they provide adequate health and environmental protection and to update those standards as necessary. Is Hillwood and Amazon going to be held accountable as these standards evolve and tighten? PennDOT has repeatedly denied the proposal for highway modifications, citing their discomfort with the plan's inappropriateness for our narrow roadways. The health implications of these diesel engine tractor trailers idling on our insufficient highways cannot be overstated. Diesel exhaust, which is designated a carcinogenic to humans by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, can lodge deep into the lungs and heart and is linked to premature death, aggravated asthma, and decreased lung function. It is stated that small particulate matter is most dangerous when it's lingering in the air closest to dispersion. In other words, our neighborhoods, our homes, our schools, and our walking paths. This is why they are designated industrial parks, which are by definition specifically zoned areas surrounding cities for industrial use rather than residential or commercial needs. Industrial parks may contain oil fineries, ports, warehouses, and distribution centers. These do not belong in our neighborhood. Lastly, just because the borough does not own the property, does not absolve the council and planning commission, and I do appreciate your due diligence here, from the responsibility of preserving the residential integrity and quality of our community. The chapter 304 zoning law should have never been changed to allow distribution centers. And where was this critical information informing my elderly and or less tech savvy neighbors who do not know how to use Zoom, Zoom a year ago? If this information is not important enough for a swift reach notification, then I ask you what is? Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next, Nicolette, we'll give it a try again. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Name and address. Still didn't do it. Okay. Okay. My name is Nicolette Armstrong. I live at 440 Woodland Hills Drive. Um, I want to talk about something I haven't heard from you yet. You talk about the trucks, the trucks. We have 1,500 employees. Um, and, and here is something no one has talked about because I'm probably the only person in Churchill that does not drive a car. I have narcolepsy. I take the bus. There's only one bus, the 67A. People use that bus to go to boys. I use it to go to doctor appointments. It will be packed. It takes a long time for Port Authority to add more buses if they're needed, but then that will be more traffic. That'll be more uh, difficulty on the roads. But I haven't heard anyone talk about talking to Port Authority. And I understand that because the normal average adult drives a car. I do not. I also do want to talk about one other thing. Um, vibrations, the, the truck vibrations are going to, I mean, it's already crazy on Beulah Road and Greensburg Pike. And it seems um, Hillwood has not done a there's not a documentation of them doing a study on this. Instead, it argues that people on Beulah and Greensburg Pike don't mind that. Well, the people that I've talked to do mind that. They're not happy. They, they don't even like the existing level of vibrations. And it will get worse. Let's not deny that. It's going to. Um, if Hillwood would rebut the residents, certainly vibration on these roads is something that can be measured. Whole body vibration can cause fatigue, stomach problems, headache, loss of balance, and shakiness shortly afterward during exposure. Um, think about it. It's going to be constant. The people, um, the residents along Beulah and Greensburg Pike already experience unpleasant levels of noise and vibration. Why would the Planning Commission approve a project adding to this problem? And why would they accept such a dismissive? and insulting response to this part of the planning code. It, it's important to, to not be dealing with vibration. So my two points are Port Authority hasn't been contacted, I don't know. Uh, and then again, if they decide to put a new bus on or more buses, then that's more confusion. But we've never discussed the, the employees' cars. They'll be driving. And you know, Amazon's very difficult with their employees. They have to be on time. That's good. That could cause riskier driving. And, and, you, we all know Beulah and Greensburg Pike were already dangerous to, to be one. 
And that's all I have to say. But I do thank you for all of the efforts that you're putting in, work you're doing, but I do have this Port Authority question. And, and I would bet that it has not come up yet. So you can thank my narcolepsy for that. Thank you. Do I meet myself now? You. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you, Nicolette, for that. And uh, Port Authority has been involved and uh, we'll continue to have them involved. Meanwhile, Tom Barellis, would you please go ahead and unmute yourself in three minutes. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Tom Barella, 1634, uh, Jamestown Place, Blackridge. <clears throat> uh, for, first of all, I wanna uh, congratulate you all for the pamphlet you set out. I sure do hope that everyone in the borough got one. And it's a shame that we didn't maybe have such a document maybe a year or two years ago. Um, I, I've been involved with some of this several years back when the multi-study was done with the adjacent boroughs and more recently with what does the community see on the um, Westinghouse site. So, uh, you know, it, it's been going on for me for a while. Uh, I, I don't, I, I, I say this so that when, what I, when I'm about to say, you know, that I say with some experience, for 40 some years, I ran a planning office here in Pittsburgh. Uh, my office was the development of Point State Park that overlooks Mount Washington and many shopping centers and schools. I, I look at this two ways. What if, one, this thing goes through? I, what, what I'm seeing right now is beautiful textbook information. It's textbook information that I myself would have done to convince people that they should build this. There's nothing here that in their report that says that they shouldn't. And given that information it scares the hell out of me because that's the kind of stuff that gets us all into trouble. Each one of the studies is again a textbook situation but lacks the realities. And probably the most biggest reality is the traffic study because all we're looking at is how you get things in the site and off the site. It does not really talk about how it impacts the region. And as an example, even the most recent thing, nothing was said about the fact that if you, when these trucks turn out onto uh, the highway and head west and get onto the west ramp into the town, you know, a, a, a single lane for that's not gonna solve it. An example of a project I did a number of years ago was you might wanna bring two, three of these 18 wheeler trucks on, on line at uh, between six and nine in the morning or between three and five in the afternoon and run them through the process of what you're going to do. You'd be surprised how a couple of trucks uh, on William Penn Highway making a left-hand turn are gonna screw things up, not only making it more dangerous. And then the other thing is, is that here is an opportunity to be creative. This, this development is not creative, it's standard. And, you know, you talk about stormwater. Listen, there's ways of using that stormwater rather than keeping it in a pipe. And no one's taken a look at this. And the tree situation, excuse me, gang, my background is I'm a landscape architect. And I have done lots of planning and I have planted more than 10,000 trees in a project. These trees are being planted in a parking lot. They're not, this isn't a park situation. These trees are being parked planted in a parking lot and what's up tom oh thank you yeah thank you i appreciate that mark you're next mark Tara, please unmute yourself yeah. three minutes thanks alex uh mark butera 3871 henley drive uh thank you for all the the thorough information it was uh, i think really well done lots of information uh, but the tom's point very textbook uh, i guess the, the one question i had is uh, was any consideration given to either the current or future actual road service conditions on Greensburg Pike and Beulah Road? They're both uh, pretty shoddy to begin with. And, you know, with the increased traffic of, you know, a truck every five or six minutes, uh, what's the maintenance look like for those road surfaces to keep them in, in good working order? That's it for me, Alex. Fast. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Elizabeth Kassman, please go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. 
My name is Elizabeth Kasman. I live at Ed Holland Road, and I want to talk about the noise study. <clears throat> the, no the noise study that Hillwood presented is both grossly inadequate and misleading. Hillwood sound study says that there won't be significant noise impacts, that the added noise on average will be equivalent to that of a normal conversation or perhaps a lawnmower, and they conclude that this will be tolerable. But the noise study has a number of na major flaws. The noise study used an incorrect decibel level for trucks, 75 decibels, which is 10 decibels lower than the Federal Highway Administration standard. Despite this gross error, instead of re re uh, revising the sound study, Hill would propose to do a sound study six months after the facility is operational. By then, it is too late for the Planning Commission to reject the project on the grounds of sound pollution. This is completely unacceptable to the residents because one, it is an attempt to avoid the strict regulatory requirements of a conditional use permit, and two, it is only a promise to do a study, not a promise to remedy detected problems. This is insulting to the residents of Churchill, to the Council and the Planning Commission. The study does not include noise from cars, motorcycles, and trucks as they move through residential streets of Churchill. Hillwood claims they are not responsible for such noise. Nevertheless, the residents will hear these noises and they should be part of the noise impact study. The median noise calculation denoted in the study as L50, upon which Hillwood drew its conclusions is irrelevant. L50 is a noise level that will be exceeded 50% of the time. People are disturbed by the loud noises, therefore it is standard practice to use the L10 levels, a level exceeded only 10% of the time to represent loud noises. The commission should re request a reanalysis of the conclusion of the noise study based only on L10. Amazon boasts that the distribution centers planned for the 2020s will increase helicopters and drones. Even small drones operate at levels greater than 80 decibels. I'll have to put my computer in, so I'm out of gas. <laughs> in the noise study, how will air traffic cop towns and ground traffic noise? Will the borough allow air traffic to operate at night? Doesn't the borough need to evaluate these issues? The planning commission must be Elizabeth, can you please speak into the mic, please, so we can hear you better? Oh, I thought I was. Um, it's, it's becoming difficult, sorry. The planning commission must require a revision of the noise report to include the future use of aircraft. In summary, Hill, Hillwood's noise report intentionally minimized the sound problem did not include the planned helicopter and drone traffic, ignored traffic noise on residential roads. It has provided deceptive and incomplete information. These planning the planning commission should require a revision of the noise report addressing these issues. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ken Balke, please. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Ken. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken Balke, and I live at 2007 Hampstead Drive, and I chair the trade committee for the borough. A um, couple comments. Uh, first of all, thank you for the excellent work on the tree survey. I did get the report and went through it, and so did uh, some of my other tree committee members. And I really appreciate Hillwood's effort to look at planting more trees, you know, in part of the project. But I'll come back, even though the trees are uh, surveyed as good, fair, poor, it almost comes across that because they're poor or fair or have some, in, we can take them down. The point is, you're still depriving our tree canopy. Our borough lost 50 acres of tree canopy in five years from 2010 to 2015. There's going to be a new survey done next year from an aerial vote. You, and, we're, and I'm struggling as a chair of the tree committee, trying to keep people to keep their tr mature trees in particular, to protect our canopy. And I don't care what shape the tree's in, it's still the canopy. If you take out all the trees that you plant here, you are definitely dropping our tree canopy percentage significantly. And we get compared against other municipalities. It doesn't matter if you're gonna plant a thousand trees, they will not make a difference for at least 20 to 30 years. To, to impact the loss that you have. The other thing of those large trees, even a tree that you coat is fair, or maybe has some ivy on or whatever the case, that tree still absorbs enormous amounts of storm water, air quality, it helps on the sound. 
So yeah. just saying, well, hey, we're taking out because it's going to be disease. It actually comes across pretty, uh, pretty harsh in that case. And whatever you plant, it's not going to matter. It works out. I looked up today, a mature tree weighs anywhere from one ton to 10 tons. So you put, I don't care if you put 100 trees for each one, they don't match what a mature tree can absorb from stormwater. Now, I'm so deeply concerned on that east face. I can't tell from your work if you're taking all the trees off. If you go to your landscape report, it looks like you're not taking them off. Some of them you are, some of you aren't. And in Carly's work, she showed that there is no proposed BMP on that east face side. Now, I've been saying for six months, I was there during Hurricane Ivan, it dropped six inches of rain in one day. In fact, I'm concerned about the chart that our boroughs having Hillwood use. The 100 year flood they show is 4.95 inches. We've already experienced a six inch uh, flood in one day. And in fact, the 25 year flood, you get four inches in a day. 12 years ago, we had a storm that dropped four inches in one hour. So I think some of the stormwater calculation, I'll put this in writing, um, but I think the chart that we're using does not match what today's requirement is. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken, I appreciate that. Next, we have John Gulo, please. John, would you unmute yourself and speak? Hi, I'm actually Lisa Edwards. I'm on my husband's computer. I'm at 2292 Elm Hill Road. Um, a couple of things. One is the exit for the Greensburg Pike. How is that now a street? If I'm understanding it correctly, because it was kind of glossed over um, on how that works, it looks like the semicircle is now being straightened out and they're calling part of that a street. If you've ever taken this exit, and I take it numerous times a day, it is a dangerous exit to begin with, but now you're going to have a slight curve, a straightened out, and then you have to take another right in order to get onto Greensburg Pike. So I'm not sure how that's going to work, especially if you've got semi trucks that are now going to be taking a left hand off of that. They're going to be slowing down and people coming off fast off of the parkway won't have enough time to, to uh, stop. So I don't understand how that works. Uh, second thing is, uh, I'm going back to one of the other ladies who talked about the noise and their study, the Homans Consultant study specifically says they don't look at noise generated outside of their site. So what they're saying is they're going to have several hundred trucks coming in and going out. And as long as they're off the site, that noise that they generate doesn't count. And by the way, the Jake uh, brakes or the retarder brakes uh, are already pretty bad on, on the highway. Now imagine this in the very early mornings, eight to 10 trucks a day. Or, or an hour, I should say. And once they do start the Squirrel Hill Tunnel, the traffic will be a nightmare. And clearly Amazon will change their schedule because they're not set there. They're giving you a truck schedule, but there's nothing in concrete. It's not a legal document, it's just a study. So they will probably have more people coming in uh, when it's less crowded because we all know uh, the parkway can get backed up on a fender bender. So the noise is going to be bad. They're going to claim it's not their problem because it's off site. And anytime you slow down a truck or start up a truck, it makes a lot of noise. Um, so that's my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Now Sandy Fox, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Sandy Fox. I live at 38 Holland Road. Churchill Future has uh, offered a resolution to delay the conditional use application, which I support. I'm going to read an excerpt from our research committee's traffic report. The code 30425G states that, quote, no design shall be approved, which is likely to create substantial pedestrian or vehicular traffic hazards endangering the public safety, end quote. Despite the Hillwood development plan calling for massive increases in both truck and car traffic on local roads and on the parkway, there is currently no traffic plan accepted by PennDOT and we don't even know what the current proposed plan is. 
Uh, there was some information presented today, obviously. Where is the plan? Where is there a clear explanation of what ramps are to be built? Why are we hearing rumors about slip ramps and relocating the borough building to Westinghouse property? The Planning Commission must not and cannot in good conscience accept such a preliminary and fragmentary traffic plan. We were told that 340 semi-tractor trailer trucks will service the facility and that each truck will make only one trip in and one trip out per day. That would amount to an approximate average of one truck entering or leaving the facility every 2.1 minutes. The community thinks that the truck and car traffic will create both pedestrian and vehicular traffic hazards. We are worried about the schools along Greensburg Pike and the daycare operated by Beulah Presbyterian Church. Kids run out of school, increasing the traffic on their streets is an invitation for tragedy. The closest homes are within a few hundred feet of the property border and houses line the major proposed access roads. We're also concerned that walking along our residential streets, which for the most part have no sidewalks, will become much more dangerous. Even the part of the study that dealt with the parkway did not provide a credible solution to the problem of trucks trying to make turns onto the parkway on inadequate ramps. Hillwood has proposed a solution to the problem of getting Amazon trucks off I-376 that violates the spirit, if not the letter of the law. Though federal, federal law strictly forbids building slip ramps to connect private commercial development to interstate highways, in the current plan, Amazon will build such a ramp to I-376, but then give it to the Churchill Borough, thereby, thereby circumventing the federal law and creating significant financial and management burdens on the borough. This is deceptive, unacceptable, and outrageous to us as citizens. The residents of Churchill demand a detailed presentation of the final traffic plan, and so should the Planning Commission. Thanks, all. Also, okay, thank you. Thank you. Ashley, you're next, please. Yes, hi, uh, my name is no problem. My, my name is Ashley Blanchetti and I live at 5 Holland Road. And I want to read a statement that was agreed upon by a group of aligned residents in Churchill Borough as a shared call to delay and deny the conditional use application. So I repeat, as a resident, I urge the Planning Commission to delay or deny the conditional use application until Hillwood and the borough have provided all information and proof that is required to make an informed decision. Based on the research of our community members, we're aware that the following items are still outstanding. Uh, the Department of Environmental Protection permits in relation to chapter 102, earth disturbance, and 105 waterways and streams for widening of a waterway have not gone through the official public process. Inputs from the Allegheny County Health Department have not been provided. Geological studies have not been ordered to understand the impact to underground mines. And also uh, PennDOT has not approved uh, any proposals and our members have filed a petition to intervene in that process. It's the commission's duty we feel to represent our community and render a decision with complete information and full considerations of the concerns of Churchill residents. Please suspend or deny this decision um, until complete information is publicly shared and considered. Um, and I also wanna add my own personal thoughts. Um, you know, in May of 2019, uh, Reuters published an article titled Amazon dismisses idea automation will eliminate all its warehouse jobs soon, which I think is an interesting title since soon is a relative term. In the article, Scott Anderson, at the time a director of Amazon Robotics Fulfillment, is quoted as saying that technology is at least 10 years away from fully automating the processing of a single order picked by a worker inside a warehouse. 10 years was his ballpark estimation for meaningful movement toward full automation. And that was two years ago. I feel this is a telling statement that acknowledges the strategy of Amazon to pursue full automation that will employ robots and technology to eliminate distribution center jobs. I feel that Hillwood and their client Amazon should project their job counts, not just on the immediate job creation, but into the future based on their automation strategies. And I wanna point out that based on automation plans, Gains in jobs that are claimed are unlikely to be or are likely to be short term. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Next would be Bonnie. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Bonnie. But you're next, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Alex. It's Bonnie Shinaki. I'm at 303 Churchill Road. I'm reading a portion of air pollution. A larger, a longer version was already submitted to the council. The code 30423F states that no air, no pollution of air shall be permitted, which is harmful to health, animals, vegetation, or other property. The planning commission has the opportunity and duty to require what the code specifies. The commission should require reanalysis of the traffic study using modern scientifically defensive standards instead of those from 2006, which Hillwood chose to use. Because some of the effects of pollution are quite local, the study should provide contour maps of pollution so residents in different parts of the borough can see risks to which they're exposed. The study should also include an analysis of the impact of removal of existing mature trees and green space on air quality. The current air pollution study contains the following flaws, which means that the Hillwood facility fails to satisfy the code. A, the study draws its conclusions from annual average concentration standard for particulate matter, not the daily average concentration, which is more relevant to the health and safety of borough residents. B, Hillwood chose to interpret the zoning code to mean no pollution that exceeds the current federal ambient air pollution standards. EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, CASAC, comprised of the foremost air pollution and epidemiology experts in the country, concluded that based on scientific evidence, Current, the current suite of primary fine particulate matter annual and the 24 hour standards are not protective of public health. In 2022, the next five year review of CASAC standard will be adopted. This is the standard that should be adopted by the council rather than the outdated standards that do not protect the public. C, the air quality report states that weights of cars and heavy trucks were averaged to calculate the road dust they produce. This produces a fictional vehicle much lighter than a truck and underestimates the actual road dust produced by the mix of cars and trucks. This trick of averaging impacts the harmful and less harmful units has been used repeatedly by Hillwood to falsely discount impacts. D. The air quality study does not account for the impact of removing 1,400 mature trees and 100 acres of green space. Penn Environment Research and Policy Center has identified a toxic 10 polluters of air quality for Allegheny County. One, TMS International Braddock is within five miles of Churchill Borough, zip code 15235. The borough is located within 10 miles of four other top 10 polluters. Cumulatively, that places Churchill Borough within 10 miles of half of the top industrial polluters in Allegheny County. Bonnie, Recently, time's up, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bob Ferry, you're next. Please unmute yourself. Thanks, Alex. Um, excuse me a minute. I'll turn off this other one. Sorry about that. Bob Ferry, 3872 Henley Drive. Um, clearly, um, the Planning um, Commission here has done a lot of work on this. The changes on the traffic um, patterns, uh, I can't keep up with them. My original support of this project assumed um, that, that there would be significant changes to the roadways. And, you know, it's kind of whittled down to some things that I'm just not sure about. But I will ask a few questions basically about traffic studies and uh, to understand better, is, is there any analysis that looks at uh, traffic or truck traffic, car traffic that gets bunched up, but we see a nice dispersion chart showing you know, so many per hour. What, what is the impact if, if things get uh, you know, come in all at once? Not all at once, but you know, there's there's uh, you know accidents and things like that that slow things down. So I mean, that's that should be looked at in this study itself. Um, are there absolutes in terms of permits? How many trucks they can bring in and out? What's to stop them from growing that number every year? Um, 
and how do we, you know, police some things? One of the things that was mentioned too was that they wouldn't send the trucks out at rush hour. And I don't know if that's still part of the plan. Um, I guess, you know, how do you police that though, right? It, you'd send our police out there and issue tickets if they do. So I, I don't know how, um, but uh, these, these are some concerns on the studies we have. So, so I really do have some issues with, um, you know, how much traffic is gonna hit our roads with this, this project. Um, on, on a second note, a little disappointed. I've, it's regarding the real estate taxes that this will generate for the uh, borough and the uh, school district. I've seen quotes in the paper um, as to how much, and you know, it 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 is uh, a counter to you know the discussion earlier about the positives of this uh, three hundred million dollar project. If if I calculate right, it looks like the assessed values are nowhere near that. And as we know, um, you know, uh, Amazon with its team of attorneys are probably going to actively pursue, you know, reductions in assessed value as best they can. So I, I really am surprised at how low the numbers are. And it, it, it seems to me that it's a small portion of the budget for, for, for at least the school. Um, so I don't, that'll be absorbed pretty quickly per year. And uh, the borough, I know you're going to have, we're going to have added expense with police and fire. Um, so as a, as a, I mean, a little after the fact, but unfortunately it just doesn't seem like a great return, but you know, that's neither here nor there. We're looking at just trying to approve the, uh, uh, the different, uh, ordinances right now. So thanks, Alex. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. Uh, next Phil O'Keefe, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, Phil O'Keefe with uh, Tracy Shirks, uh, 2040 Hampstead Drive. Uh, I was gonna just basically remain silent and listen, but uh, the, the traffic study thing kind of set me off a little bit. Um, so I was looking at, I don't know if you can, you can't really see it. It's, it's the one that they, the second slide that they showed showing you um, the, the, the new rendering of the, of the area. Um, on Beulah, specifically between uh, Beulah and Churchill Road. So I grew up here. Um, I, I lived in France where they had roundabouts, which were awesome, for 10 years and I waited for college. But I used to pick my dad up from that facility. He was a physicist for Westinghouse. And the traffic leaving there caused a huge snarl for cars going out of the facility left to try and get on to 376. There, you'd have to wait three light changes to exit Westinghouse at that time of day. Nowadays, I still rank that light, the one at, that crosses uh, 22 and, and Beulah, as probably the worst intersection that I go through on a daily basis, easily. It takes me two, two, two light turns to get through on a normal day when, with no one there. It also takes me, I sit there waiting for two minutes at 6 a.m. on Sunday when I go to play golf and there's no one else around. But the biggest thing that set me off was the fact that there's a, a bigger lane. I think there's five lanes on 22 each way. There's five lanes exiting, going down Beulah Road towards Churchill Country Club. There's five lanes going towards the bridge, 376 bridge, and then it comes down to four. So that is a literal definition of a bottleneck, right? I don't care what you do. If you can have six lanes on one side of that bridge, you can have eight lanes on the other side of that bridge, that will be a bottleneck and that is the main issue of that light. I know you're trying to expand the distance between the two intersections, which also causes um, delays. But I, I guess, is there a, a, if you're ever gonna go through this, which I hope you do not, to expand, take down that, the Parkway East Bridge, expand it and make it three lanes each way. Because if not, I don't see any way that that's going to not snarl traffic for anybody coming out of Churchill. Because the people coming from Churchill Road, right, they want to come in and then go left onto 22 and sometimes go straight on Buell Road. All the trucks coming out of Amazon are going to go left and then make the right onto, right onto 22. So that's a big X and a bottleneck. And that's just going to be a major traffic nightmare. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Peter, please unmute yourself. Peter uh, Spritz. 
Uh, my name is Peter Spurdies and I live at 1903 Hampstead Drive. Uh, I fully endorse the delay or deny statement from Churchill Future that was read by Ashley. I'd like to make four points about sewage treatment at the proposed warehouse facility. Uh, according to Hillwood, pending permits slash approvals required for the Churchill project site to proceed include the water and sewer use availability approval from Alcasan. However, the ordinary way of handling uh, sewage for a new development is not available to Hillwood. Ordinarily, the way a new development would treat sewage is to hook into the currently existing Alcasan sewers and use their treatment facilities. Alcasan's reply to an inquiry from Hillwood was, quote, no capacity determination can be granted for any expansion at this time since the extent of the development is unknown. This interceptor has sufficient dry weather capacity for the current flows. However, the Turtle Creek interceptor and the Woods Run treatment plant do not have capacity for the flows generated during wet weather periods. This limitation will be addressed as Alcasan implements its clean water plan. Note that Alcasan here makes no promise of when the current overflow problems would be fixed, let alone a promise that there would ever be additional capacity to, hire, to accommodate Hillwood's request. Alternative methods of handling sewage are not available to the proposed warehouse facility either. According to documents from Lang and Engineering and Hillwood's submission for a conditional use, quote, the existing developments in the area are all currently connected to the public sewer system. Therefore, an on-site septic system would not be consistent with the neighboring buildings, nor would it be a practical solution to provide adequate service for the site. The nearest discharge point from the site for a stream discharge is Sawmill Run, immediately east of the site. A packaged wastewater treatment plant with discharge to Sawmill Run is not feasible due to the scope of the pro proposed development. Additionally, existing topography is prohibitive to the construction of a packaged wastewater treatment plant. They did not suggest any other feasible alternative. Alcasan, in terms of can they provide uh, more capacity, has been under a consent decree with the EPA since 2008 to reduce the overflow in the county from 9 billion gallons to 2 billion gallons during wet weather. 2019 modified consent plan extends the deadline for compliance to 2036. The, 2000, uh, <clears throat> the current plan already costs $2 billion. According to the executive director of Alcasan, quote, nothing at this point is cast in stone in terms of how we achieve. In other words, they don't actually have the plan yet, which they have to 2036 to implement. Uh, Alcasan is not free to do whatever they want because of this consent decree, because the EPA and the state are both supervising. A large part of the reason that we have this overflow problem into the rivers currently is because the uh, development cut down so many trees and uh, uh, removed vegetation and paved over too much ground. That's how we got into this mess. What Hillwood is proposing for this site is exactly what caused the problem to begin with. As far as I can see... Sorry, Peter. Thank you. Again, written comments, please. Uh, that's the best way to get them to us, thanks. Glenn, you're next, please unmute yourself and begin. Yeah, uh, Glenn Waters. And uh, what I'd like to say is, uh, first of all, if, uh, if you look around to see the uh, participants, you'll see none of the Hillwood people are here to hear the residents uh, messages. Now, they may be relayed, but to me, they should be here firsthand to hear. They're not here, none of them. So, uh, uh, part two on that, uh, METS basically said that they are going to be a great partner, and not only would they contribute to this distribution center, but they would also contribute money to other uh, uh, community uh, activities. Well, they built the center down in Finley in 2019, the same group, and then they sold it in 2020. They built it for 30 million and they sold it in 2020 uh, for 100 million. So they're out of there. So they may have that for us also. Part three on there, um, I have a, uh, everyone is talking about what would it look like to see these uh, trucks and all. I have a video that's taken off of Facebook 
from a, uh, a, a young lady named Anna Gonzalez, Anna I. Gonzalez. And uh, it depicts the, the, uh, the, the uh, trucks entering uh, a facility, Amazon facility, um, very similar to the one they're proposing and how they're on the roads and how they're idling and how it's already been stated that they're against the law, but they're still idling. If anyone would like to see that video, and especially the planning commission, you really should take this into consideration. Uh, it's, uh, you can reach me at, and just put, send me an email at gvwaters19 at gmail.com and I'll gladly send, just put in their video in the subject and I'll send that uh, to you so you can view it for yourselves. And uh, the planning commission, please, I am uh, with the other concerned citizens, please deny and then dismiss this proposal because it's, I don't believe it's to the benefit of the community. There are a lot of misstatements and, uh, and the facts are uh, that the check marks that Hillwood makes are not the ones that are really going to affect our community. They're extremely conservative in what they say, but when it comes to reality, it's going to be very liberal how they will act in our community. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Lauren McGowan, please, you're next. Hi, um, my name is Lauren McCon. I live at 56 Holland Road. I'm uh, demanding that the Planning Commission deny the conditional use application until Hillwood and the borough have provided all information and proof that is required to make an informed decision. Um, the residents of this community are aware that the following items are still outstanding. The permit, uh, the DEP permit in relation to Chapter 102 and 105, inputs from the Allegheny County Health Department that have not been provided, geological studies that have not been ordered to understand the impact on underground mines, and PennDOT has not approved these proposals, and our members have filed to petition to intervene in that process. It is your duty to represent our community and render a decision with complete information and full consideration of the concerns of the residents. I demand that you suspend this decision until complete information is publicly shared and considered. I would also like to add that um, Hillwood makes mention of net positives and quote their um, solid valued community partner standing. My question is what concrete examples can Hillwood provide uh, that prove that reputation as a solid and valued community partner, especially um, this process so far. I would like to know um, in what ways have the, has the school district been approached other than uh, to been asked for a tax abatement? I would like to know how Hillwood intends on um, to incorporate into their, their plan for educational reimbursement and jobs training programs. How are they going to include the students of the school district in that um, proposal. I also should add that I spoke with the students of the Woodland Hills Climate Action Team last week about this issue and their questions were unsurprising but they said things like, well doesn't that mean that we're going to have more air pollution? Doesn't that mean that we'll have hundreds of trucks going in and out of our neighborhood? Doesn't this mean that when they cut down those trees that they're not going to be cleaning carbon? And while we might see it to be a little, I don't know, short-sighted, that's the reality of the situation. The students are poisoned at home, and now we're going to poison them at school, right across the street. So my final question is, how does Hillwood or the borough plan to meaningfully incorporate the voices of the students and the uh, district's board in this process? And um, again, I call for concrete evidence from Hillwood about their, their solid and valued community partner status um, and their environmental practices, because I'm looking on your website and I see a small handful of sustainability measures. And so I challenge you to prove that. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Susan Starrett, please. Hi. My name is Susan Starrett. I live at uh, 1903 Hampstead Drive. Um, I also support the deny or delay or deny demand, although I recommend deny. Um, 
as people who watch these meetings know, I've already given many comments and spent many, many hours reviewing Hillwood's applications. Um, now the borough so solicitor, but today my, what I'm gonna talk about is different. It's not gonna be the details of the design. And here's the reason why. The borough solicitor last planning commission meeting gave a list of requirements in the zoning code and said if the applicant checks all the boxes, then planning commission is obligated to approve or, well, um, and then what, what does this list of boxes consist of? And he li this listed a bunch of studies and a height requirement. This was very depressing to me. And someone encouraged me to go actually go look at the zoning code and I did. And now I uh, realized this is not a complex decision. This is not a complex decision for the planning commission at all. It's simple, it's really simple. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. The criteria for approval is 304-31, and it has an arm of it that the borough solicitor did not explicitly mention. There's two arms to it. That is a conjunction, two separate things. One says that um, the proposed use shall not involve any element or cause, 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 any condition that may be dangerous, injurious, or noxious to any other property or persons, and shall comply with and that's the part that all the studies address. Has to meet both of these, both of these, okay? Now I see how simple it is. You have to say no to this. You're obligated to say no to this. Um, so according to the co zoning code's list of criteria, studies are not criteria. Submitting studies is not criteria. The zoning code's list of criteria for conditional use application, which is what you're making a judgment about when you make a decision, you're obligated to deny this application if it doesn't meet that requirement about not causing any of these conditions. Um, as I said, that's in addition to these studies. Now, um, here's why I say that. Well, the zoning code says that you have to consider the question, will the proposals, proposed use of the property cause a condition that may be dangerous? Um, the answer to that is yes. We know the answer to that is yes. Tractor, it's going, it's a, the whole idea of the facility is to have all, be a place for all these tractor trailer trucks to come in and go out. That's what it is. There's no getting about it. No study can mitigate that that's what it is about. Okay. Now they can carry up to 80,000 pounds and they cannot stop in the time that other traffic can. Thus, they tend to run into vehicles in front of them, especially in wet weather. And moreover, their weight greatly increases the harms that result when they do collide with cars. You may remember about two years ago, there was an accident uh, at Rhode Island Road. Um, what was that accident? There were- Zoom, the time is up. Okay. That, that was a truck coming down the hill that ran into cars. We have it on tape still. So thank, thank you for your time. The next would be Mark Sampson, please. Uh, good evening. I'm Mark Sampson, 2417 Greensburg Pike. I too uh, would urge the denial of the conditional use plan. And I'll be reading from the research committee's work on a couple areas this evening. Uh, as noted earlier, uh, concerning light pollution, uh, Mike noted uh, correctly that the Hillwood plan deals with direct light, but not with reflected glare. This facility is going to glow at night. And so we'd urge the Planning Commission to require Hillwood to address this portion of the code. Uh, as pertaining to remediation of the site, we've been consistently told that there are no alternatives because only a developer with deep pockets could afford to remediate this site, estimated perhaps at $40 million. However, experts retained by previous owner of the site estimated the remaining environmental remediation would not exceed $3 million. Uh, that's a pretty big difference. What is the real figure, folks? What is the number? And of course, we heard this evening that uh, they've applied for the RCAP uh, grant, uh, and we heard that that was to help mitigate the increased cost of building materials. So taxpayers are uh, gonna foot the bill for Amazon's increased cost of building materials. With respect to contaminated soil, a 2011 environmental site assessment report prepared by NOVA consultants found that soils were not consistently in violation of state regulations. They took 56 core samples, uh, both shallow and deep with a special emphasis on known uh, or suspected waste disposal sites. 
Uh, three of the deep samples showed uh, contamination below or above uh, federal standards, and seven had uh, of the shallow had similar levels. So all this soil uh, does not have to be removed to remediate the site, just some of it. Hillwood noted tonight that this is a, a soil neutral project, no soil in or out. So they're gonna take whatever contaminated soil that they found here, place that into downslope, uh, half of the giant plateau that's created and uh, the groundwater running through that then ends up in their catch basin system. Is this remediation or are we creating a, a leaky landfill? And finally, on the appearance codes, we talked a lot about trees uh, and the screening of a massive facility like this. Hard to believe some of what we've seen. What we've been asking for as residents is a 3D architectural model. We've not seen that. Uh, we want to see exactly what this will look like uh, instead of the alternatives that they've shown us. Uh, we thank you for your time and effort, council members and commission planning members. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Stephen Klump, please. Hello, my name is Stephen Klump and I live at One Rose Drive. As a resident, I urge the planning commission to delay or deny the conditional use application until Hillwood and the borough have provided all information and proof that is required to make an informed decision. Based on research of our community members, that would be the Churchill Future Group, we are aware that the following items are still outstanding. Department of Environmental Protection permits in relation to chapter 102 and 105 have not gone through the official public process. Inputs from the Allegheny County Health Department have not been provided. Geological studies have not been ordered to understand the impact to underground mines. Also, PennDOT has not approved proposals and our members have filed a petition to intervene in that process. It's the commission's duty to represent our community. That would be us, the residents, and render a decision with complete information and full consideration of the concerns of us. I would say, I demand that you suspend the decision until complete information is publicly shared and considered. A few personal comments. Air quality in Allegheny County sucks. And the air study said, we're just adding a little pinch more. Here's something to consider. Every snowflake claims innocence in an avalanche. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And just for everyone else, um, if we've heard the comments a couple times, um, you know, try to not repeat those uh, for the sake of everybody who's trying to participate and you know take notes and do those kinds of things. Kathy, you're next. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I agree with the statement read by Ashley Blanquette, Lauren and Stephen uh, from Churchill Future. Uh, I won't repeat it, but I agree with it. Uh, I'd like to talk about the process tonight. We would like to address the question of what standards the planning commission should adopt. The whole point of the zoning process is to control what owners can do with their property. The council and planning commission have a fiduciary responsibility to preserve and protect the health of the community and environment. The um, responsibility of council and planning commission is to preserve the welfare of Churchill residents. You represent us in this matter. We are asking you not to turn Churchill into an unpleasant, unpleasant place to live and raise families. There are health and environmental zoning code requirements without specific numerical standards, specifically noise, air pollution, traffic, buffers, and nuisance determinations. For these, the Planning Commission should and can impose higher standards than those selected by Hillwood, standards that will protect all the residents of Churchill. You should not accept the analyses you have been presented. You should demand that mitigation actions actually reduce the problems to acceptable levels. The county cannot deny a permit based on extreme events, but the borough can because of the broad language of the code. For the county, applicants only have to evaluate spe specified storm sizes. The borough should demand better performance from the developer. P 
Pennsylvania will be 8% wetter in a couple of decades. Why not plan for that level instead of historic and no longer representative rainfall? Also, I would like to support what Susan Sterrett was saying about uh, sec chapter 304-31. I would like for Hillwood to detail how are they meeting that section of the code, chapter 304-31. I urge all residents of Churchill who are following this issue to read that code. You will see the word shall, and shall means shall. And I would like for Hillwood to justify how they are meeting that. Finally, I would like to talk about the RACP grant. I think it is absolutely shameful that Hillwood has applied for this grant. And I suggest that they, they pull back their application to say that they had to do it because of the cost, increased cost of materials is laughable. Everyone in this country is facing that. And we're not asking the government uh, to subsidize us. Uh, we were told that it had to, the code has to be, had to be changed back in November because somebody with deep pockets had to do it. Well, those deep pockets apparently are mine and I object. Thank you very much. Kathy, X would be Joe, please. Joe Cuddalick, Nikki, are you here? I am. Please go ahead and speak. <laughs> sure. Sorry about that. Um, I, <laughs> I can't get my... How about now? Yes. Now? Yeah, yeah okay. I can see you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your patience. I won't uh, speak long. I am... Um, you know, I, I hear all these very well-educated people talking, and it's, it's amazing. And I just want to, I'm not going to repeat so much of what I agree with, what Mark Butera said and Mark Sampson and Ashley Blankett and Lisa up on Elm Hill. So many have said so much, but I want to just take one minute to look at a common sense approach. So many people have talked about study after study after study. And, you know, the, and I agree with all of it. But the one thing I noticed is the infrastructure around this facility and how I, I just, I take these roads every day to and from work and I just can't fathom this traffic study. It, it baffles me how they think that these short on and off ramps that people have to take. If you're coming down, you know, 376 and you're, you're getting off the Greensburg Pike exit, it's a very short stop and a very tight turn. If you're trying to merge on at, you know, off of, um, Penn, you know, Penn Avenue there to get up onto 376, your car better go fast. Those trucks don't move fast. They move slow, they slow down slow, and they pick up slow. All I can see is traffic backed up all over the place because these trucks simply can't meet, you know, what they're going to have to do to merge onto the traffic. And that's, you know, so that's, that was just one observation that I made. But other than that, um, I think so many people have spoke so well. I agree with Ashley Blankett and her, um, what she talked about on denying this. I think it's well written and, and well said. And I hope that the Planning Commission and Borough Council recognizes that you don't represent Allegheny County and you don't represent, you know, regional planning as, as far as the eye can see. You represent the taxpaying borough citizens of Churchill. That's who you represent. So please, Take a look at what you're representing and what decisions you're making and how it impacts Churchill Borough. Thank you. Joe, could you tell me your address? I, I got oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 2326 Marbury Road. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ruth, Ruthie Ray, you're next. Again, name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Ruthie Ray and I live at 35 Holland Road. As a resident, I urge the Planning Commission to deny, deny, deny the conditional use application. As stated previously, it's the Commission's duty to represent our community and render a decision with complete information and full consideration of the concerns of all of the Churchill residents. 
and I'm gonna repeat something that I shared last month. I'm still very concerned about environmental justice and the impact of the Hillwood Amazon project on the community and children in the school district and surrounding communities, which are environmental justice areas, Braddock, Rankin and Turtle Creek. The Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement involvement of all people regardless of their race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. I want to speak to the Code 30427. It requires existing stands of mature woodlands, natural wetlands, and steep slopes shall be developed so as to minimize adverse environmental effects, unnecessary grading, and clearing. The overall landscape plan shall be in keeping with natural surroundings. The Hillwood plan calls for the disruption and disturbance of over 100 acres of green space by leveling a hillside and taking down many mature trees. The number continues to change, so I won't quote the number. The planning commission and council need to protect our existing trees and green space. In addition to the aesthetic beauty of the park-like campus, the trees capture dangerous air pollutants, as we know, and reduce flooding of nearby roads and homes. The stormwater plan does not mention the effect of discharges to the wetlands. Inundating the wetland with large volumes of dirty stormwater does not protect it. Nowhere in the presented slides today or otherwise and documents that I've been able to view was this issue ever mentioned. This is exa an example of the failure of Hillwood to appreciate the complexity of the Westinghouse site in, the, in its redevelopment plan. The 2011 phase two environmental site assessment report prepared by Nova Consultants for FP Churchill found sandstone and limestone bedrock depths of 12 to 14 feet below the surface. Amazon is planning to lower the surface by 20 feet, removing all of the soil and some of the bedrock. The north end of the site will be a bare rock plateau, absent of life supporting soil. Once Amazon leaves, the site will be ruined for centuries. Given the destruction of hundreds or thousands of trees, paving over many acres of vegetation, cutting off the top of a hill and installing many large air conditioners, the site could become a heat island from which the hot air blows into the neighborhood. Hillwood must provide the commission and the residents of this community with a report on the local microclimate it will produce and how far it will extend off site. The commission should demand this information and so do I. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Uh, Jean Pasternak, please uh, unmute yourself to speak. Yes, hi, good evening. I'm Jean Pasternak. I'm speaking on behalf of my parents, Jane and Bud Pellegrini, 461 Woodland Hills Drive. Um, I first want to say that I demand that, that, that this um, proposal be denied, along with all the others that have spoken. All I heard from Hillwood tonight were the benefits, which overall will vastly accrue to them and their Amazon tenant. I did not hear a single mention that there are huge costs to Churchill Borough and its residents. I learned this basic tenet of evaluation in my freshman year at Carnegie Mellon. Mr. Ferry touched on the, this most basic demand, a complete full cost benefit analysis, including an impact analysis on residential property values, health and safety, on residents and so forth. This has to be done and this is disingenuous for them to come here and present only benefits. We are not stupid and it is very rude for them to present something in that way. The second thing I'd like to say is um, I was able to visit while, while um, with my parents several of the neighborhoods around the area. The vast majority with one exception of every door I knocked on were citizens that said they are strongly against the project. They said this flies in the face of the history of the borough and its master plan. Most of these neighbors were elderly, disabled, economically and technology challenged. They had never been able to participate in any Zoom meetings during this pandemic and nor can they in the future. They expressed a feeling of frustration, isolation and deception by their elected officials and their appointees. On their behalf, I am demanding an in-person community meeting so that every resident in this borough has a chance to voice their concerns and their disagreement with this plan. The other thing I would like to um, mention is the RCAP grant. I, I concur with the um, earlier commentator. Uh, this is appalling to have been presented in the way it was by Hillwood. They're taking taxpayer money 
to underwrite a project for Amazon? It's disgusting. I mean, there's no other way to say that. They even stand here and, and present something like that. The second point is 1,500 jobs at $15 an hour. So is that somebody making 30 grand a year? Where are they going to live in this area for 30,000 a year? Okay, give me a break. Third, the traffic study. I mean, anybody that's gone to work in downtown or anywhere way in that direction is backed up to Penn Hills on the parkway every freaking morning, Monday through Friday. Are you kidding me to think that, did they ever actually get in the line and sit there trying to get to work, Hillwood? Maybe they need to get in their cars and have a practice run before they present any more traffic studies. And then this nerve of them to say, well, we could put a do not block, block the box marker like they do in Manhattan. That's another farce. I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous to compare the borough of Churchill with 3,000 people in it to millions of Manhattan, New York. I mean, honestly, be a little bit more genuine, could you? And then finally, when it comes to um, all the traffic, there was never a single mention of the employees coming in and out and what impact they're gonna have on this community. It's gonna be a big difference to have that many people 24 hours a day. What are their shifts? Where are they gonna eat? Where are they gonna park? Where are they gonna pee? I don't know, all those questions. Why are they not oh. pictured? Thank you. Thank you. Ray, the last please, Ray, unmute yourself and speak. Hi, thank you. I'm Raymond DeLask from 33 Churchill Road. And I would like to just say that I do agree with the delay or deny statement that has been made early in this meeting. Um, and I will also say that I do appreciate that uh, Hillwood and the engineers did provide additional information for review. Um, however, I do believe that there are still things that they need to provide responses to. Um, some of them have already been mentioned, so I won't reiterate, but um, the biggest thing that I'm concerned with is there are still many statements made that do not have technical justification. So specifically, the 74 decibels is a big thing that I've mentioned, and I know a few folks have mentioned before, but that that was not specifically addressed when uh, Hillwood was addressing questions about the noise study and the traffic study. So without technical justification, that's that study. Um, I don't find that study valid if they can't justify why they use values that are not consistent with Department of Transportation values. Now, another thing uh, in line with statements that do not have technical justification. So going back to the statements about truck traffic will not go through the borough. They make those statements and they show the, the planned routes for the trucks, but they don't provide specific justification for why those trucks will not ever go through the borough. And uh, with the changes that are going on with the Square Hill Tunnel, and then whenever there's traffic on 376, traffic diverts and it goes through Churchill Borough, it goes through Churchill Road and it goes through other roads because it can cut around traffic. Like that's just a fact of, of this area. Um, but the thing that I find most concerning about many statements that Hillwood and their associates made, um, apologize, my camera turned off. Um, I find concerning about some of the statements they made that did not have specific technical justification relate back to RCAP and uh, what was done with that. So this group of people made an explicit statement that they would not take government or would not take public funds for this. Then their situation changed and they walked that back and they took public funds. So that statement they provided did not have any sort of legal implication. So many of these other statements they're making that don't have technical justification or any sort of legal requirement, what is to say they will not walk that back once their situation changes? So these are very big concerns for me. And the fact that they walked back the statements on not using public funds, I find a considerable statement on the integrity of this organization. Now, uh, that being said, all of the things that I've mentioned and there's a lot of other people have mentioned here relate back to one thing that I don't think has been explicitly said at this meeting tonight, which is all of these concerns present a very clear um, public nuisance. 
And that is specifically discussed in the code for Churchill. There are many things, noise, traffic, infrastructure degradation, all of these things pose a public nuisance. And many of those key things are not being explicitly addressed with technical justification by Hillwood, Amazon, and their associates. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, next, Kate Kerrigan Hill, please. Hi, I'm Kate Kerrigan Hill. I live at 1441 Viola Road. And I wasn't gonna say anything tonight, but I simply have to. And I'm gonna repeat something I said once before, which is, look at me. Do I look like I was born yesterday? Does anybody remember the song, Big Yellow Taxi by Joni Mitchell? Anybody at all? The entire meeting, I have thought about that song, which is they took paradise and put up a parking lot, which is exactly what is happening here. I moved from Highland Park and I was pretty nervous about doing it four years ago because I had never lived in the suburbs before. And I had never lived among all these trees and among all this beauty. And, and that's not to say that Highland Park wasn't beautiful as well, but it's different in the suburbs. So we're taking paradise and we're putting up a parking lot. I, one of the most impactful statements I have heard regarding any of this was said a couple of months ago, which is Amazon's sole purpose is to create truck traffic, right? That is their purpose. So who buys a house in paradise with truck traffic? Who does that? Not only that, in the very beginning of this meeting, it was discussed health safety and welfare. Tell me what is healthy about 18 wheelers in a neighborhood? What is safe about 18 wheelers in a neighborhood? How are we, how are we taking care of public welfare with 18 wheelers in a neighborhood? Not in an office park, in a neighborhood. The more I think about this, the longer this goes on, you can tell the angrier I get. I was not born yesterday. Maybe if I were younger and naive and had my eyes wide open, I might think this is great. This is Amazon. These are jobs. This is nonsense. You do not take paradise and put up a parking lot. You do not mess with the health, safety, and welfare of residents living in a neighborhood. You do not destroy. You you never, ever destroy a neighborhood and all of the green space which surrounds it. You simply don't do it. And I am infuriated that Hillwood is not on this call or not this part of this meeting because they have to hear this. They can go with their glossy, shiny new objects and show us those all day long. We are not we are not fools and we were not born yesterday. And the people who bought houses in Churchill with the expectation to retire here should be able to do that and, and not deal with this. And those with young families that bought here with the expectation of raising their children, which with, without ever having to worry about truck traffic, which is the purpose of Amazon, they should be able to live here comfortably and raise their families. Okay, I'm, thank you. Yeah, Kate, and um, just, just for those who are curious, I, I see the principals from, you know, Hillwood here. I see their engineers here. So I'm not sure why, why there's a misunderstanding or a thinking that they've left, but they do obviously are going to hear all of these comments in spades. Thank you. Good. Thank uh, so you. next we have, I'm sorry, I got to get back to the top of the list. See who's got their hands up. Molly Owens, please. Molly Owens. Hello. Yes. My name is Lolly Owens. I live at 101 Fenwick Drive. And my husband and I have been Churchill residents for a little over a month. So when we found, we were unaware of this development when we bought the house, we moved from out of state to Pennsylvania 
Uh, I was born on the north side and David was born in Washington, PA. So we wanted to come back home at this time of our life. Uh, I am just, um, I am requesting that this be, this effort be delayed or denied because it is just um, not healthy for the community. I guess the, one of the things that popped up into my mind because neither of us have had a chance to read the reports that have been generated is what kind of citizen is Amazon? And I think uh, someone here, um, I think it was Mr. Glenn Waters mentioned a video and I had already seen that. And I recommend that everybody um, take a look at that video because it denotes what kind of citizen Amazon in is in a place where they already have a distribution um, center. And then the other question I had is, I heard that it's a federal law that the diesel trucks cannot idle for more than five minutes. Um, I guess an hour is what I think I heard. But then they didn't say anything about the smaller trucks that Amazon uses and how long are they allowed to idle and poison the air? And then someone else raised a question is who's going to police this? So um, hello neighbors, it's, it's kind of odd meeting you this way, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Steve Landy, your last please, as far as the hands go. Hey, thanks Alex, can you hear me? Thumbs up. Okay, thanks. Um, Ditto to every every one of my other colleague, uh, Churchill Future colleagues have said, um, I only offer one question and it's to the planning committee. And it's this, you members of the planning committee, why aren't you asking the same questions that we're asking of the Hillwood group? You, you are, you're our neighbors and so is the council of, of, of Churchill. So you, you know, we're all neighbors and we all want the best thing for us. I would like you to be asking the same questions that we are asking now. That's it, Alex, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Eric Rotzinger, you're next, please unmute and speak. This is Eric Grotzinger at uh, 2373 Hollywood Drive. And if anyone thinks that the 133 acres of the Westinghouse site is paradise, I just ask them to go up there and look at that place. It's decaying. The buildings are full of asbestos, lead, mold, this was a, a research facility. There's, there's chemicals up there. And if the residents want that just to stay up there and continue to be an environmental hazard, I think that's wrong. And Hillwood has hired Langen Engineering, which is a very reputable engineering company. And they are doing rigorous studies that not only meet local, state and federal guidelines, but in some cases, as we saw tonight, exceed those recommendations, demonstrating that this project will have minimal impact on our community. In addition, these critical studies by Langen must be finalized with the borough engineers, and that's gateway engineering. Also, one of the NE, um, NEN uh, top 500 engineering firms. If these studies demonstrate acceptable mitigations of traffic, parking, lighting, noise, air quality, stormwater, and environmental quality, then this is our opportunity to not only reclaim this toxic site, but to reap the benefits that it will provide our community and region. Again, let me thank Alex and the council for the thoughtful and rigorous process they are doing on the pr proposed redevelopment of the Westinghouse property. Thank you. 
Thanks, Eric. Uh, next, um, I'm not seeing any hands right now. I did see a hand a minute ago, but the hand went down. So what I'd like to do is I'm just gonna scroll through the list. If you haven't had the opportunity to raise your hand, you can do that. If you've already had, um, we're not gonna go back. So I'm gonna scroll down through, I'm gonna change my view here. And Alex, talk. there's uh, Kathy Sima. Okay, go ahead, Kathy, unmute yourself and speak. It's Mike. Mike Sima, Six Holland Road. The first three words in Churchill's website is a residential community. In the traffic study, we see in the peak AMR 630 trips and the PMR 780 trips. The total day, 672 truck trips, 4,560 car trips, a total of 5,232 total trips. This doesn't sound like a residential community. The developer is printed. In conclusion, the proposed sort project will have minimal transportation impact on the surrounding study area. How is that possible with 672 truck trips and 4,560 car trips? Their sound studies indicate 35 mile an hour speed to measure decibels. There are no 35 mile an hour steady state areas leaving the site. All the roads from the site are uphill. Trucks will be shifting through many gear changes, producing much more noise in particular. The developer has printed, the findings in this report support and conclude that the on-site operations of the distribution center will not create any significant adverse sound impacts at nearby receptors. How is that possible with 672 truck trips and 4,560 car trips? We have road weight restrictions. Beulah Road is a 20,000 pound maximum. Bottom of Greensburg Pike, there's a sign 10,000 pounds maximum. Churchill Road from the exit to the site, 20,000 pounds. An 18 wheeler weighs 25,000 to 35,000 pounds empty. Pennsylvania allows 73,280 pounds fully loaded. We must conclude any tractor trailer would be running illegal on those three roads, even if they are empty. Do we just ignore the weight limits on Greensburg Pike, Grand Boulevard, Beulah Road, Churchill Road to suit the development? I have to wonder how the developers would feel about 672 truck trips on the street where they live. A mistake was made in the 50s with this site development. Let's not do it again. We have a governing of the people by the people, for the people. But I think it's pretty obvious we the people don't want this development. 672 truck trips, 4,560 car trips. I think the numbers should scare us. First three words on Churchill's website, a residential community. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. And Richard Ekman, you have your hand up, please. You may speak. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Richard Ekman. I uh, live at 2289 Elm Hill Road, and um, I have kind of a different uh, thing to bring up for consideration. There have been many, many, many people very justifiably concerned and making very eloquent comments and arguments about uh, you know, protecting the safety and well-being and uh, quality of life for the people who live here, um, looking at things from a different angle, and this actually does factor into, in my view at least, the quality of life in Churchill. Um, you know, I moved here with my partner seven years ago, and one of the things I love about living in Churchill is that I'm able to step out into my backyard or at the end of my driveway or look out my dining room window pretty much any time of the year and see a beautiful variety of wildlife. We've got turkeys, we've got hawks and falcons, we've got so many different kinds of birds. We have deer, we have nature around us. We've got wildlife, we've got a really nice environment. And I would love to know just exactly how this development would, would affect that. We know for a fact it's going to adversely affect the quality of life for the human beings who live here. 
part of the quality of life, I would argue for this area is that we're able to enjoy living in harmony with nature, uh, you know, and beyond that, uh, yeah, I do think it was a salient point to make that, you know, the people who are on the planning commission and the people who work on council, you do live here. You're, you're our neighbors. Uh, I'm curious, I would hope that you would share our concerns. And the last point that I would like to make is simply that um, if this gets rammed through, as quite frankly, I suspect it will be, okay? Uh, none of us are gonna be shocked if it is. If it is, and if Amazon does prove to be uh, a not very nice neighbor, I just wonder what council will be willing to do or able to do if they'll have the backbone to do anything about it. Because if this facility going through does adversely affect the quality of life and the safety of the residents, I really hope that you be just as willing to step up to protect us and to do something about it, even though it's going to be well after the fact. And I would like you all to take that strongly into consideration. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne, please go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. <laughs> Hi, Joanne Skanga, 30 Churchill Road. I, I just have two comments. In a report I read about how Amazon selects or Amazon developers selects their parcels of land, they look for areas that are blighted with weak local governments and little oversight. So as my um, resident friend there said that they can ram these projects through. Buyer beware of the so-called panacea for Churchill. I urge the planning commission to vote no. The other comment I would like to make is I think one of the real enemies here is PennDOT. We really need to get in touch with PennDOT and have them present their opinions as to why they feel that they can redistribute the roads and make different ramps and all this and it not affect us in any way possible, it's going to affect all of us. The traffic here will be immeasurable. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Julie, Carl, please. Hello, my name is Julie Carroll and I live at Seven Locksley Drive. I agree that the plan must delay or deny the conditional use application until Hillwood and the borough have provided to all Churchill residents all of the information and proof that are required to make an informed decision. All of our residents of all means, abilities, and ages must be able to access all of the Churchill public meetings. The council and the committees are well aware that seniors and low-income residents are unable to comply with the protocols currently set up. This is a, is a discriminatory practice and exclusionary of all residents. On behalf of the Churchill Future Outreach Committee, I demand that council schedule in the month of June an in-person community meeting to review the Amazon Warehouse distribution center project so that the entire community may participate in a robust civic discussion of the proposed Amazon warehouse distribution center project. Thank you. I will look again, scan through um, the hands, you know, just the, as that's happening, uh, we've had over 10 hours of comments given to us since August on this subject and probably uh, several hundred letters. Um, so it's a lot of comments for 3,000 3, residents. So we've had a lot of participation in these meetings. Over 150 people participated individually this evening. Uh, so I have Rose. Thank you. So your hand up. Please, Rose, go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Rose, would you I'm please? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Something else popped up. I, I'm, I'm just wondering, how many letters have you had in support of this project? That's a great question. Um, probably 10 to 1. Uh, 10 to 1. The ones who support 
And, and in the ones that are in support of the project, why are they supporting it? Can't enumerate all of them, but I've been summarized somewhat here tonight. Uh, community benefits, jobs for the community, similar things, but yeah, really that's not germane right now. We're well, I think comments. importantly, I think Churchill Future, and I think this needs to be absolutely clear, is that Churchill Future wants jobs in the area. Churchill Future wants to see the Westinghouse Research and Development Park redeveloped. We want to see jobs, but we want to see sustainable jobs that there was there. Um, I forget the woman's name who talked about um, that Amazon is a great employer, but they within five years are going to be a job eliminator, that these jobs are transient jobs. It's like almost like hiring people to come and pick crops. They're seasonal. They're going to be gone. And then we're going to have the same situation of people were employed and now they're unemployed. Um, you know, I think that we, we just need to look at this rationally, rationally, not emotionally. So I think that, you know, some of the things they believe that they're going to be these great paying jobs, the drivers of the delivery trucks are allowed to work 35 hours because then Amazon does not have to pay benefits for them. You know, it's a, a somewhat great employer, I think maybe, but it's, te they're temporary jobs. You know, the whole question of our, the value of our homes. Some of the people who I've talked to said the value of my home is going to go up. Are you kidding me? The value of our homes are going to go down. So I think that some of the reasons that these people are supporting it need to be absolutely clarified and with honest answers. Thank you. Guys, would you please give me your street address? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, 1921 Garrick Drive. And I've lived here for 32 years. And Thank I feel you. heartbroken for the people who moved in a month ago. I see them out walking. And welcome to our community. I hope we can save it. I hope we can save it. Thank you. Okay, so let's go through and Dennis and others who are looking, if you see other people who have not raised their hand yet. Um, so given that, um, Madam Chair, I'll hand it back over to you just on behalf of- um, I know Alex. Yeah, Alex. Anybody on the phone else? Yeah, Alex. April, you want to go ahead and speak? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, this is April Klein, 18 Holland Road. Um, so you know, I listened to, I've attended all these meetings and I listened to all the comments tonight. And with the exception of one person, all the speakers have been against the Hillwood Churchill Creek project as proposed. I urge my neighbors and all the listeners on this call to read through the zoning law change that allows conditional use 